Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I would like to introduce our speaker today. Um, Beverly Burnett has been doing this for a long time, and she is really wonderful. And so I would like to welcome Beverly. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Beverly Burnett, and I am a grateful member of Al-Anon. I guess that's in case I get hungry. (laughs) Or if you don't like me, I could stab myself in the heart. (laughs) Oh, you know how pathetic that would look. (laughs) Well, I do know my the day that I came into Al-Anon. I came into Al-Anon on the day that I put my 15-and-a-half-year-old son into treatment, which was February 9th of 1981. And I am so grateful to be here Um, and just um, thank you all for being here to support this workshop and um, and to come out on a Saturday and uh, I heard somebody back there that that say that the mind can only absorb what the bottom can take. I'll try to make this painless. (laughs) I'm I'm going to break in um, at uh, 1030 which is so you only have to sit for an hour and a half and then you can go out and Um, there's some restrooms back there and some refreshments in the corner and uh, you know if you do feel like you have to move around please do so go around the back edges and um, but you know you're not you don't have to feel nailed to this chair Um, this is such an incredible opportunity for me to do this I I loved speaking at conventions and you know it's been a it's been a, a grace kind of a thing for me to have been called to be able to do that from time to time but the thing I really love doing most of all are, th- are these workshops. And I want to tell you how this workshop was born because it was born as a fundraiser in, 19, in the summer of 1990. Um, <clears throat> my life was grim in the summer of 1990. My father had just died. We had just found out that, that, that my son uh, was also uh, dying of AIDS. And uh, he had just moved to Texas a short time before this was going to take place. And this lady called me up from our intergroup office, which is also a literature distribution center. And she said to me, we'd like to have a fundraiser, and we would like you to do a workshop from about 9 in the morning till noon. And did you ever just feel like you absolutely did not have anything to share? And that's what I said to her. I said, I haven't got a clue. I mean, I... I just lost my dad. He's been sick for two years. And then in the midst of all that, we found out my son was also dying. I said, I just really don't have anything to give. And she said to me, well, we all have something to give. And um, so then we sat there and I said, oh, she, she, actually, she made me feel really guilty. (laughs) And so, um, because she had, she had, she was, you know how we are, we are determined. And once we've made up our mind about what we want, well, she had made up her mind that I was going to do this workshop and there was no way that we were going to not do this workshop. So that's what happened. So she said, what would you like to do? And I thought, I guess she didn't hear me. I just told her I didn't want to do anything. <laughs> and she said, well, it's in 1990, everybody was interested in relationships. And if you could put relationships in the title of anything, you would have, you know, the multitudes would show up. Well, so she says, let's, whatever it is, let's put relationships in it and you do whatever you want. And I thought, I says, well, that's kind of dishonest. You know, we don't want to do that. So we tossed it around a little bit and um, ended up with this relationships and self-esteem and the relationships being many. So I'm going to talk today about seven or nine different kinds of relationships. Um, My relationship with Mr. B was 41 years old on Monday. And uh, and so we have gone through many phases from ooh baby, ooh baby, ooh to, you know, just (laughs) peaceful living and then some, you know, we'll have some chaos and we'll, you know, we have had everything. You know, we've lived through the death of a child. We've, you know, we've nurtured grandchildren. We have pets now where children used to be. We have had all kinds of phases to our relationship. It would be very boring if I told you about my relationship, only if that was all this was about. But what I'm going to talk about today are my relationships 
with God, with my, with my Al-Anon program, my relationship with myself. I've had, you know, when I got here, I had no relationship with myself at all. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know what my favorite color was. I didn't know that I had this gift of photography. I didn't know that I ha could eventually become a nurturing, wonderful grandmother because I was, a, I was just a, an unruly, unmanageable, angry mother. And so there were many phases to my development finding out who I was and what I liked. And it cost Mr. B a lot of money until we finally settled into something that I thought was me. Um, and, uh, and he's been just really gracious about it. I'm not sure if he understands the journey that was involved in that, but he has just, um, he's just let me be who I needed to be. So then there was the relationships with him and the relationships with my grandchildren and my, my daughter-in-laws. I have two sons with my sons um, and with friends and money. Um, we all have a lot of, seem to have a lot of problems in the area of money and money being a god or, you know, this, this feeling of not having enough. So I'm going to talk about a lot of relationships. Probably I'll mix in there a little bit my relationship with this incredible golden retriever dog that I have. And um, we also have an 18-year-old Siamese cat who I just realized, a friend, I had a house guest for a couple of days, and I'm going to tell you two things. First of all, she discovered, she told us our cat was deaf. That's why she's screaming so loud. And secondly, a few days after she came home, she called me to thank me for, for opening my home up to her. And she told me, she's, Beverly, I don't know what else to tell you except that you walk the way you talk. And, and she has listened to me do workshops in, in California for years. And, you know, nobody is really sure that you are who you are when you're up here. And, and she affirmed to me, she says, you walk exactly the way you talk. And I thought that she gave me the greatest gift that I'd ever been given. And, um, and it's not like it, it puffed me up or anything else. It, it, she just assured me that, that the evidence of the program was available in the way that I lived my life with, with my husband and in my home. And it was a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful thing. There wasn't, she could have spent $5 million on me, and she couldn't have given me anything better than to tell me that, she, in her opinion, I walked the way I talked. So um, I live in Louisville, Texas. I've lived there for 24 years in the same house. Um, I attend meetings now at the, at the Friendship Al-Anon Family Group, which is only two and a half miles from my home, but I was a founding member of the Horizon Al-Anon Family Group, and I went there for 18 years. And due to the construction of, of um, the Bush Expressway or 190 or whatever it is, State Highway 190, it just got too complicated to get to a meeting. I never knew if I was going to be on time. And it was, it, you know, I'd get there and I'd be frazzled. And there were some other things going on. You know, when you grow, your perception changes, your needs change. And I realized I was changing. And, and so this complication with the driving and everything, all of a sudden one day, I went to the Christmas party three years ago and I walked out of there and I thought, I think I'll just be a full-time member of Friendship. I had been going every Monday for one year to just kind of see if I could make it my home. You know, change is so hard for us. And I realized that I could. Um, I was exposed to wonderful program all over. Um, you know, my husband and I do this tape business and... And I'm with people, I mean, my entire life is, is Al-Anon and AA-related. I mean, I have no outside. Um, there's just nothing going on on the outside that keeps telling, God, are you sure this is all you want from me? And he goes, yes, in your case it is. <laughs> he knows I can get very distracted, so he has created this whole life of program around me. And it's just, it's, it's a wonderful life. I have a, I have a wonderful life today. Now, there's days that, you know, I, I want things a little different. You know, I'd like to go live up in the Pacific Northwest with my grandchildren or near them, not, not too near, don't want to watch them real close, but I like the climate up there. So some days I'd like to do that. And some days I think, well, another dog would be nice. Or, I, or some days I think, you know, I, I'd like to travel. Well, I do that, you know, enough. I don't need to do that. And there's just some things, and all of a sudden I'll get myself feeling a little restless, and I have to bring myself back and think, you know what, Beverly, you have an absolutely incredible, perfect life, and I do. Um, not problem-free, not at all problem-free. Please understand that it's not problem-free, but I have a wonderful life today. And if nothing else, I can see that, and that's great. Um, <clears throat> 
So I've kind of, I'm going to ask you why are you here? I don't know if you want to answer, but kind of think inside of you. Why did you come today? What are you looking for? Kind of know what you're doing. Why are you here? Um, you know, where are you with your program? Are you in the program or are you in the fellowship? Makes a big difference. I hung around the fringes of the program or the fellowship for almost a year because I loved the coffee and I liked the laughter and I loved the speaker meetings and I loved the birthday parties and I loved chip night and I loved, I loved listening to the al most of which I did not relate because I've always been a self-willed, um, go-get-it, stomp-on-you kind of an al -Anon. I think there's two kinds of al -Anons. There's the kind like me. And, my, and several of my friends, like Ellen, <laughs> were, and then there's, I, I really believe that, that, you know, there, there's kind of the, the doormat kind of al who just really got abused and, you know, was threatened and, and unworthy and everything. And it's not that we didn't feel those things, but then there's the really aggressive kind, and <laughs> the barroom brawler kind of al -Anons. and Sue D and Vinoy and, and Mary Pearl are kind of those kind of people, and I fall into that category. And once I kind of realized that, that it changed, it was like, we, no wonder we're not all going to agree on the same path to recovery, because we don't all have the same experience. But I've always been self-willed and demanding, and I've always wanted the biggest piece of pie. Winnie, if you listen to her tapes out there, she'll, she'll tell you that she was taught, and it took forever for somebody to teach her to take the biggest piece, the first piece and the biggest piece for herself, and then allow the children to be served next. That was not my case. I always took the first and the biggest for me. So um, anyhow, why are you here? Um, do you still believe that you can change someone other than yourself? And uh, that is, such an, that is an, an idea that's inside of us. It's like in every cell of our skin and our soul and our heart is that if we could make something about our life different, we would be better. And that's why we're all here. That's what Al-Anon really is all about, is that we are, we are discontent with the people and the places and the things around us as a result of being affected for a long period of time by the disease of alcoholism. We become thinking, you know, if we could get rid of this person, if we could have this, if we could have a bigger kitchen, if he would just quit drinking, if he would be grateful for all of my wonderful attributes, you know, I would be better. Well, the fact is, is that isn't going to happen. So what Al-Anon teaches us is that even though we have been deeply affected by the disease of alcoholism, that we can be happy whether the alcoholic is drinking or not. We can be happy whether Carol still sits in the next cubicle at work. We can be happy even though this year they have decided not to give us a raise because of you know, the economy. We can be happy even though we haven't got enough money to buy the new dress we'd like for the holidays. All of these things you know, interfere with our ability to be happy. And that's because of the way that we were raised and the, and the effects that alcoholism has on us, that we think if something out there was fixed, we would be better. And in this program, we're taught to find a higher power, a God of our understanding, and to begin to change everything about us. <laughs> so, do you want to be here? Or has your sponsor sent you because she's pulled her hair out and says, I don't know what to do with you next. Please go to that workshop and listen to that lady. Maybe she'll say something that will help. Um, and that's okay, too. You know, we didn't get to this program. My husband and myself and, and our children, well, our oldest son got here because he probably wanted to be, but maybe not. All of our motives for coming here are different. But what we hope is that you'll stay long enough for recovery to begin to happen and from that thing where somebody says go and then all of a sudden you think oh my god it's Tuesday and I wouldn't miss it for the world and that's the that's the switch that begins to happen it's the day you claim your chair here it's the day you come because you want to be here and um, I don't know when exactly that happened for me somewhere in the first year it wasn't in the beginning I did not I my intention was to be here 28 days um, as soon as Scott got out of treatment on March 8th we put him in on on February 9th, and, and on March 8th, I was out of here. So, I mean, that was my intention, and um, I'm coming up soon on a 22nd birthday, and can you imagine that? I mean, from thinking I'd be here 28 days to being here almost 22 years, I mean, that is just absolutely amazing. And then I've already asked you to ask yourself if you're in the fellowship or you're in the program, and there is a vast difference because we can sit in the rooms of Al-Anon, and I'm sure in Alcoholics Anonymous in the fellowship for years and not have one bit of recovery. 
Because, see, we have this little trick thing called being able to talk the talk. And as long as we're talking the talk, nobody's really sure except you whether you're walking the walk. And sometimes, because we're people who live very comfortably in denial, you can think that as long as you're memorizing the steps and the traditions and you know little blurps out of your ODAT book or your courage to change or, or you know exactly where to find something in, in the dilemma of the alcoholic marriage and you're sponsoring a bunch of people, it does not mean you're in the program. Only you know if you're in the program. Are you really taking these steps into your heart and are you really trying to apply them? Have they become a part of you? Have they become your very pulse? You know, and all of a sudden I found out one day that I didn't have to work the steps, that the steps were working me. And that, you know, that's another one of those things where I thought somewhere or other I switched and I stepped. Oh, now, I depend largely on the fellowship today. Oh, I mean, I love the fellowship, but I have a program. And so, you know, you can ask yourself those, question, those questions because it is a big deal. I am a woman, so I will be speaking to you from that experience, and I am an Al-Anon, and I will be speaking to you from that perspective. <clears throat> One of the things that I know here, and it's, it's been a real peaceful part, is that no matter what's going on around me, that God will always calm the child, but I am never guaranteed that he's going to calm the storm. Because the storm doesn't include me. A friend of mine was talking about putting a hula hoop on the floor and anything outside that hula hoop was none of my business. Somebody else says if it's beyond the end of your nose, it's none of your business. Somebody says you can stretch your hands out just as far as they'll go. You can lean if you want to. But if it's beyond the tips of your fingers, it's none of your business. So, but the business is, is that I can be calm no matter what. And even if it's beyond the end of my fingers or even if it's in here, whatever it is that's going on, God promises to calm me, but he doesn't promise to fix the situation. Um, you may be sitting there today believing that this program will not work for you, but if you can sit here for the next few hours today and believe that this program has worked for me, that's all that I, that's, that's enough, is to know that it works for somebody else. And then eventually, hopefully, that'll change, and you'll begin to understand that it is, in fact, working for you. And, um, and that's been one of the great things for me is that I sat there for a long time looking out there, seeing God work miracles in everybody's lives, and I thought, you know, I, but I'm so good at this, but he's not, he doesn't even know I exist. And then one day I realized, you know, through some little situation that God did, in fact, well, it wasn't a little situation. I'll tell you about it later on. It was quite a big situation because it was the day that God got my attention. So um, I guess one of the things that, that happens to you when you're in recovery is that um, uh, you just can be anybody you want to be, and that's the wonderful thing. And there's a little, there's a kind of a poem or a thing. It's called, When I Am Old, I Shall Wear Purple. And I love that because it gives us permission to do just about everything. And it's not conference approved. I'm going to stay as conference approved today as I absolutely can. But this is not totally conference approved. So every once in a while I'm going to slip in a little something that I've gotten out of a book or, or somebody has mailed me or I've picked it up off of a table at an Al-Anon conference. And, and I'm, so I'm not going to be totally 100% conference approved. But... Um, I have a conference approved program, that's all you need to know. But I love, I love this thing because it allows us to be eccentric. And we are such rigid black and white people that never change one single thing about us because mom did it and grandma did it and, and alcoholism demanded it of us. And, and my husband was a bully when he was a drunk and he, scared the, he just scared me all the time so he kept me rigid in an old belief system. He wanted to control me and that's the way he did it. And if, I'm not calling him names, bullies are in the big book. You know, it's a form of alcoholism, it's a form of fear and that's the way he controlled the universe and his wife was to bully me. My mom, you know, was, was a kind of a bully in her own kind of a way. She just would get out her cat of nine tails and just you know, just paddle me with that. And so she would control me. And then all of a sudden I come to Al-Anon and they say, you can be anybody you want to be. And we don't even know who's in there. What an exciting thing, you know, to find, to come a place where you find out who you really are, what you like and what you want to be. And this little poem says, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say I have no money for butter. 
I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. I can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausage at a go or only bread and pickles for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But no, we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street. We need to set a good example for the children. We will have friends to dinner and read the paper. But maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me will not be shocked and surprised when suddenly I grow old and start to wear purple. And um, it's just fun. It, it's a lot of fun to do things that are kind of ordinary, out of the ordinary. And I have encouraged that in my grandchildren. And I allow little kids to take their shoes off and run in the gutter and rain. And, and I let them have big umbrellas and, and, you know, just do things that they would ordinarily not, you know, get out, anything that's out of that rigid controlling where you get to experience something about God or about fun or about just being who you are. So <clears throat> I'm going to begin with my relationship with the program. I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you about my past and giving you the, my, my story because this is my story. Um, the, the things that I'm going to talk about in relation to the program and, and God and my, and my relationship with myself and my husband, that is my story. It's just going to take me a little bit longer to tell you. In the ODAT book on page 329, it says a fairly unusual idea in some Al-Anon groups is that we attend meetings only to hear other people's tragic stories blow-by-blow blow descriptions that we can perhaps identify with. This is one, but only one, of al functions. But when the stories are a continual rehash of the alcoholic's misdeeds, nobody hears exactly, uh, nobody hears anything except that we all go through pretty much the same experiences. Where, uh, where, where is the growth in that? If I want to determine how much help a meeting can give, I should ask myself how many of the people here tonight have learned something about applying Al-Anon. How many have given me a constructive idea that I can take away with me and use? This is the only measure of a truly valuable meeting. Today's reminder, what I say at an Al-Anon meeting should not be a recital of the details of somebody else's faults and actions. I have come to get knowledge on how to deal with my frustrations and difficulties and to impart what I have learned in Al-Anon to others. Personal problems can be discussed with my sponsor and another Al-Anon friend. And so basically I'm going to try to follow that today. Um, we're all here because we've been deeply affected by the disease of alcoholism. Um, we all have our very own uh, encounters and, and experiences with that. And what I want to do today is tell you how I got from point A to point B because I'm telling you I'm not the same woman that was in the program 22 years ago. <clears throat> Today, um, to, th there actually was more to that. A truly valuable Al-Anon meeting is one in which we concentrate on principles and do not discuss personalities. I will, however, discuss my personality. Uh, today, I have, um, uh, today I will share how I have changed, how I have how my life has changed, how my relationships have changed, and how my God has changed and become mine. Uh, unless you, this is your very first Al-Anon meeting, I am not going to say anything new. I think that anybody who walked into the doors of Al-Anon within the first, if you were there one week, went to three meetings, you have heard absolutely everything that you need to know about Al-Anon. You've seen the slogans on the wall, you've seen the steps, you've seen the traditions. Hopefully they have read the suggested welcome and the suggested closing or the Al-Anon preamble. The welcome, however, and the closing are filled with promises. And if you ever want to have a great Al-Anon meeting, just have one on the opening and focus on all the promises in there because it's incredible what, what were promised in that opening and in the closing. So I'm not going to say anything new. You know, there's the concepts are on the wall in my group, and we read the concepts along with the steps and traditions. And we focus on, you know, the, the, the literature. We have literature meetings and step speaker meetings. So nothing's new. 
But what we do here, it's called repetition confirms and strengthens and faith comes. And the other problem that I have is I forget what I know. So on a, the reason I go to Al-Anon is because anything that I learned last month, it's gone. Then I have a new problem, looks like a new problem. Actually, it's the same old problem, but it has a different face on it. Sometimes its face is George, but sometimes its face is Dorothy. And so I think, oh, new problem, need to go to Al-Anon. Then I find out it's about the same old thing. I'm not letting somebody live and let live. So, you know, we just keep walking through life, applying the same little pieces of wonderful, wonderful spiritual information to problems that look different, but they really are not. They're basically, I feel like I came here with this can of worms. I have about seven worms in my can, and I keep messing with those same worms day in and day out, month after month, year after year, and my worms are selfishness and self-centeredness. Um, I like at control. Um, gossip is in my can of worms. I have a ter you know, I, it is something I'm, I'm working on harder now, and this year has been a terrible year because I have, you know, I am really concentrating on what does it really mean, who you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. It does not only apply to the room of Valanon, it applies to when you're speaking to your sponsee on the telephone. When you're speaking to your sponsor on the telephone, it's a matter of that that trust that we have to gain here. And so what was gossip for me 22 years ago, it's changed today and it's a little more subtle and I try very hard, you know, to really monitor what I'm saying. But every once in a while, like everything else, it takes a different face. And so, um, you know, the, the, the worms in my can, you know, are, um, are always there and I just keep messing with these same worms. Um, Let's see. I think the one thing that I was asked early on that really focused me in on my program, I was six years in Al-Anon and I got a new sponsor. And, um, and she said to me, well, if we're going to start to work together, what I want to know is what are you powerless over today? And I said, didn't you hear me? I'm, I have six years of Al-Anon. And she said, yes, Beverly, I heard you, but what are you powerless over today? It never occurred to me to... to to look at that on a daily basis. What am I powerless over today? And any day that I forget to look at what am I powerless over today, I, you know, I'm going to be in deep doo-doo because something's going to come up and it's just going to bite me in the butt. So I have to always try to look, review my day in the morning and think, you know, what's coming up today or what is there that, that I'm going to be powerless over today. In Al-Anon, I'm learning about me, how to change my behavior, learning forgiveness, co what caused my resentments, how to resolve conflict. Uh, Al-Anon gives us our first look at people like ourselves because all of us have spent our whole life with our drapes shut, the front door closed, and, and living behind you know, this, this, these walls thinking nobody knows how we live. Most of us didn't know how we lived. I mean, I thought my life was perfect. I thought my children were perfect. My car was perfect. My shag rug was standing up straight. Dishes were always done. I, am the, I iron and starch collars. I mean, and so if you would have knocked on my door on February 8th of 1981 and said to me, you know, Beverly, I've been looking through this little slat in your Venetian blind and I think you have alcoholism in here and I would have just shut that slat and said, you mind your own business. Everything is just fine here. Can't you see my cars are washed and waxed and my floor is shining and my rugs are straight and everything? And see, um, I didn't know that I was covering up this huge secret, not from you, from myself. I didn't know I was living in active alcoholism. And do you know why I didn't know I was living in active alcoholism? Because it was the only way of life that I knew. My father was an alcoholic. My mother reacted to his alcoholism. My brother became an alcoholic. My dad's brother died of alcoholism. My mother's dad died of alcoholism. You know, then I married an alcoholic. He didn't look like one. He had a job and a car. I mean, you know. The fact that he didn't show up on dates and, you know, lost things that we couldn't find. I mean, I didn't know because that didn't look like my dad. I just thought that he was quite the guy. You know, I just thought he's exciting because my father, see, contrary to my husband, was always home at 5 o'clock. 
He always parked his car in exactly the same place. After dinner, he sat and read the paper. And if we didn't pay attention and be quiet and eat our dinner, he banged on the table, which was a porcelain-covered metal table, and everything jumped up in the air and fell back down again. And then he'd say to us, eat that damn food because the children in China are starving. And I'm telling you that I'm still eating for the starving children today. I mean, it's just... So I got here, you know, and I didn't know that my life, there was anything wrong with my life because it was all that I knew. It was all that I knew. My behavior was like my mother's, and, and I just thought if I could get him under control, we'd be just fine. And the other thing that I found in the program was unconditional love. It was my first experience with true unconditional love. And when my grandmother was alive, she was 4 feet 11 inches high and wide, and I was born this tall. I'm, f I'm almost 5 feet 8 inches tall, unless I've been shrinking in my old age. I don't know. I still like to say I'm that tall. But I got this tall really early, which gave my mother an opportunity to tell people I was big. It wasn't until I got with you and you told me, you're tall, Beverly. You're not big. You know, you're really, you're, you're tall. There's a big difference. So when my granddaughter's with me this week, and she's off with some friends that she met in Crested Butte, having a good time, and when people say to her, oh my gosh, she's gotten so big, and I'll look at them and say, no, she's grown tall, because, and it doesn't bother Sarah, doesn't bother her at all for people to say you've gotten big, but boy, it really bothers me, so um, the unconditional love that I experienced was from this grandmother who I sat on her lap until I was 16 years old, shortly before she died. The next experience I had with unconditional love was my first sponsor. And that lady always used to say to me when she hung up the phone, I love you. But during the phone conversation, she would say to me, okay, Beverly, okay, just calm down and blow your nose. I'm still doing that today. If you see I have this mountain of Kleenexes there, I still have to blow my nose a lot. So unconditional love happens in this program. And um, in, our, in either our welcome or our closing, it says we do not have to like everybody, but we have to love them in a very special way. That's unconditional love. And that's about gossip and criticism. We have all, we're, we are all wounded when we get here. We're so, we feel so unworthy. And this is a room full of people who accept us for exactly who we are. You know, in no matter what state, and I've gone from states of fear and anxiety and, and controlling and anger and on mountains, in valleys, and no matter what has happened to me personally in my life and my journey, you have loved me no matter what. And no matter where I go, people love me. They remember me. They hug me. They tell me they're glad to see me. It took me a long time to believe that when you were telling me that, that you really meant it. That you really, and today I know you mean it. Because I'm thinking, I feel that same way about you. I am so happy to see you. And there's people, there's wonderful faces in here that as I'm looking around, I've seen. And, you know, people that just love me. And, and I love you back. And it's so comforting. But most of us, it's going to take a long time to be able to feel that love and to accept it. I mean, why would everybody, anybody come up to you and say, I love you, Beverly, if they didn't mean it? You know, why would they say that? And um, why would they tell me that they liked my outfit if they didn't mean it? Why would they waste their breath? You know, or, or why would they, any compliment that we have, why would people in this program do that if they didn't mean it? So we have to finally get enough self-esteem in this program to believe that what you say is the truth. And we don't lie to each other here. We really try not to because it's damaging. The other thing that is important in the program is to share honestly. The sharing, the honesty of the sharing is the way that we grow. <clears throat> now, sharing honestly can take two forms. We can share honestly about all of these people's character defects and the perception that we have about our problems and our miserable lives. And we can be really honest about that and descriptive. And we can, be, we can have a lot of gestures involved in that. And we can be funny about that and we get a lot of attention. But the fact of the matter is, is it's really negative. We're not giving anybody anything that they can put in their hat and take home and use. So the honestly, the honesty and the sharing here is to have is to have the ability to share honestly about how our worst things have become our better moments. Let's give people back something that they can use. Think about that, you know. And we try really hard. We don't uh, demand it, but you know, we ask that we keep the focus of our meeting on the topic. 
and that we share from the Al Anon perspective. It's part of our, it's part of our opening. Um, because if you come from another 12 step program, your perception of the problem is different. So we try to share from the Al Anon perception. We try to share our victories so that the newcomer and the old timer, because I forget what I know, can take home something and use it or be reminded and go, I could have had a V8. <laughs> so um, we have to be careful the level and, and our understanding of sharing honestly. I think that the hugs <clears throat> and the gifts of friendship were the things that I really cherished the most in this program. I loved, I did not love to be hugged in the beginning by the men. I liked going into the AA room and having the men hug me. I loved the men. Now, because of my situation with my mom, I didn't like women. Most, you know, the, I, I just had a hard time with women. Um, I didn't relate to the women. I really related much more to the men, especially the alcoholic men. Well, of course I did. Um, and I had to learn, and I did that by going to women's conferences, how to accept the hugs from women and the gifts of friendship from women. And today, you know, that is my life. My women, not only the women I sponsor, but my women friends, that is my life. And, I, and people, not only in my home group, but in other places, will say to a hurting person, Go over there and tell Beverly to hug you. She gives wonderful hugs. And I do. And it's a gift of this program. I can take another woman or hurting person. And because I've had this, this thing with a death of a child, I get sent a lot of hurting people. I mean, that is, without a doubt, one of the deepest scars and wounds that your soul will ever survive is the loss of a child. And I can't tell you how many women and men have been sent to me or call me because I have that like experience and all that they really know is that you can survive. Because in the first year after you have experienced the loss of a child, you can't even believe that anybody can live through a year. And so I get, I get to do this. It's, a, it's such a privilege. I was at a convention last weekend and my hostess lost her daughter a year ago last Jan July 1st in a one-car accident on a rainy highway. And it was such a, I mean, I can't even imagine a knock on a door by a police officer. I mean, I got to nurture my son through five years of illness and by the time he died, it was like it settled inside of me that I was going to lose this child, but I can't even fathom that. And I have so much compassion for people who lose their children in, in fluke accidents and they're here one minute and gone the next. I can't even comprehend that. And so, you know, I get this great privilege of being able to hug hurting people. And it's not just about that. It's about anything. And sometimes we forget to breathe. And my deal is I'll hold them for a long time. Sometimes they'll weep and blow snot in my collar. And we just, you know, we just, and I hug and I hold. And then all of a sudden I realize that it, I may have held them for three or four minutes and they have not breathed. And I say, I want you to know I'm not going to let go until you breathe. And all of a sudden they go, and you feel like they just lost 15 pounds. We hold so much in, you know, in our shoulders, in our, in our upper torso, so much in. You know, we're just, oh, if we breathe, we're going to lose control. And so we have to learn to breathe here. And, and the hugs, you know, and these little reminders to do that are all the wonderful gifts of the program. I went to a place called something bur mission burritos or something last night I want you to know I still have a little mission burrito in my mouth <laughs> um, laughter now when you grow up in alcoholism and you and then you marry an alcoholic there's not a lot there was not a lot of laughter in my house there was not a lot of laughter it was serious we don't laugh nothing's funny <laughs> nothing at all is ever funny you have to be heads up here and then I couldn't let my guard down with my children. Because if I would have let my guard down with my children, I, would have felt, I felt like I would have going to lose, lose control. And so I was always rigid and angry, and there was not a lot of laughter in our house. Now, I want to tell you the kind of laughter there was, and it's two kinds. Some of us can be really, really funny regarding somebody else's character defects. And if we can point out, you know, something about the other person, I have a great sense of humor. I can be really funny. And I used to be really funny pointing out George's character defects. And one day when I was very new in the program, he retaliated against my sense of humor and he hurt my feelings publicly. It was public humiliation. 
And I called my sponsor the next day, and she wasn't there, and I called her back, and she still wasn't there. So I, her husband says to me, well, Beverly, why don't you tell me what's going on? Maybe I can help you. And I says, he hurt my feelings. I says, we were with a bunch of people last night, and this is what, well, well, what was your part in that? Well, I didn't have a part in that. I only said, and he says, well, I think your sense of humor was directed at him, and he felt bad too. And I never realized that that was the way I was using my humor, was to um, make somebody else look small so I could look big. And that was the whole deal. It was about my self-worth, my self-esteem. If I could make you look small so I could look big, and the only way I could pull that off was to, ha was to do it with humor. Now today, I love to laugh. And, it, you know, and, and the sillier it is, it, I'd rather it wasn't about anything at all. Just laugh about stuff. Um, anyhow, I, have to, I laughed on the phone with my sister yesterday. My niece, this is sad, she lost her cat a week ago Thursday, and she has just been in such pain about this cat. And, and I happen to know the Humane Society girl comes to our meeting who adopts and rescues cats. And so I hooked them up, and they put an APB out on Riley, and you know, hoping that they could find Riley. Well, my niece put her two babies in the back seat of her car yesterday and was going to run a couple of errands. And out of absolutely nowhere, um, this big bird, and oh, the, a cockatiel, flew and sat on her shoulder. And I, my sister called. She says it cost her $75 for a cage and everything else. And I says, well, you know what? <laughs> Maybe it was God's plan that she couldn't have the cockatiel if she had a cat. <laughs> and you know what they say, a bird in the hand. <laughs> You know, it was funny, but I thought, you know, maybe this bird needed a home. Who knows how God works? We have no idea what the plan of God is, but you know what? She was supposed to have this cockatiel, and he needed a drink and some food and seems to be happy. So um, so it took a sad thing, and, and she has this joy of this new pet, you know, and so anyhow. Encouragement. We encourage people in this program. We encourage people. I don't know how you are, but I'm always saying, you can do it. You can do it. Wow, that was great. You really said that? Wow, that must have taken a lot of courage. You really did that? Oh my God, that's wonderful. I love to be encouraged people because people encouraged me. I was afraid of height. Couldn't go up and down elevators, stairs without backs, couldn't climb mountains. And all of a sudden, as I began to step beyond my fears, people went, you really walked up the stairs? Wow, that was great. Oh, such courage. You know, you really... You really did this, you really did that. So we encourage each other. When we stop bad behaviors, when we gain new behaviors, if we have the willingness to share, people are going to go, cool. And then they'll go, shoot. You know, if Tracy can do it, I can do it. You know, if, if you can do that, I can do that. If Joan can do that, I can do that. You know, and we are just, all we do here is encourage each other to just become more than what we were. Um, now, on the other hand, in order to really feel like you are not in the fellowship, but in the program, you should have responsibility to your home group, have responsibility to your service office, take a small job. And my small job in the beginning was to be the literature chairman. And I thought I did that so well that I did it for seven years. Now, nobody told me that it was about rotation of service or that we should allow the newcomer to be literature chairman because it gives them an opportunity to feel like they're part of the group. They just let me be literature chairman for seven years because I had some idea that I was the best literature chairman there ever was. And finally, one day, somebody says, why don't you uh, be treasurer? You have banking experience, our treasurer. Why don't you be treasurer, Beverly, and let go of literature? Well, I want you to know that was my literature. <laughs> and I said, I'd be very happy to take on the treasurer, but I don't want to give up literature. And they said, well, you can't do both. Come on, Beverly. Let literature go. Let somebody else have it. Well, I kind of looked around the room, and I thought to myself, there is nobody. Now, there's 50 or 60 members of Horizon. I could not see one single person that could take over literature and do it nearly as well as I did. Well, I want you to know that the least likely person got the literature, and I was so upset. I thought, she will never be able to pull this off. Well, I want you to know, less than two weeks after Anne was literature chairman, she came rolling in the back door with a literature cart that she had made at the local high school with a teacher that was the craft or the the shop teacher and it has 
racks in it where they could put the literature up and it was displayed and it had a locking door on it where you could throw you could either throw some money into this hole and it was locked or else they could put the donations in there store extra literature in there it had a padlock on it it was on these big huge ball bearing rolling wheels it was painted blue and had white shelves and I looked at that and I thought well I'll be damned <laughs> You know, I, how dare her show me up like that? <laughs> so, I was chairman, I was, the, I was treasurer for my new home group. You know, they said, sign up if you want to feel a part of, be a part of. So, I got into this new friendship group just as they were, you know, gonna, going to um, elect new officers. And lo and behold, there was the treasurer position open, and I thought, well, with my banking and all my experience with Horizon, I'll just be their treasurer. And I held that position for three years because it was easy for me to do. See, I can justify anything, it, including violating the traditions. Um, I thought, it's easy for me to do in spite of my travel and all this stuff, and I'm always, then it encourages me to go to the group conscience meeting and the business meeting. So I, and then, we had the beginning of our group conscience meeting when we were electing new officers and I had held this position three years and out of the new book, um, just for, I think it's called Just for Today, she read a page about rotation of service. And I looked up at the board and I thought, hmm, I'm the only one that's held a job for that long. I guess she's talking about me. <laughs> so I rotated out of my treasury position and allowed somebody else to have it. And you know what, this girl is doing a fine job. And... Um, it, you know, but it's just, it, it's just that weird stuff. It's that, you know, we, we just latch on to something. Maybe you're not like me. I know, hope you're not. <laughs> but it is important to have a responsibility to your group, even if you're the one who picks up all the trash and throws it in the garbage can and puts all the chairs back. Our group, you have to, they, they ask for cleanup volunteers on Saturday morning at 8.30. Now, I'm hardly ever there on Saturday morning at 8.30, but today's my last our last work and my last speaking commitment until the 10th of January and so I intend to go be a cleanup person for the few weeks that I'm home because I can do it then and um, I'm really good behind a vacuum cleaner. <clears throat> um, risking to share where you are today. In 1986 my husband lost his job and I, and I thought I've got six years in Al-Anon and I'm certainly not going to let them know that I'm afraid. I have financial insecurity. I have I was doing this role-playing kind of thing. I needed to let you know that I had six years of recovery. And certainly anybody with six years of recovery would not be afraid if their husband lost a job. And finally one day the pain got so great I broke down in a Saturday morning meeting and I said George lost his job after 33 years with this big corporation. He got laid off. And, um, you know, what are we going to do now? And I don't know where the money's going to come from. You know, we've got so much severance pay and so much um, unemployment. And then it's gone. And, you know, and he decided he was going to start a business. And I got really scared about that because I've had this corporate paycheck and the insurance and life insurance and all those things that you have when you were our part in a. And then I had my identity. You know, behind every good man is a good woman. Well, I didn't know that about myself until he lost that job. And I, a whole bunch of my ego was wrapped up in what he did for a living and how many people he employed and how many secretaries he had and how many supervisors he commanded. I mean, all this stuff. I mean, I just had to say the name of the company and that my husband had been there that long. You know, I could see people stand up and look at me a little different. Well, you know, then um, I got the rug jerked out from under and I thought, who am I? It was one of those times where I had to sit back and wonder, who am I, you know, and realize I'm not my, the numbers in my checkbook. I'm not what I drive. It's, I'm not what my husband does for a living. I'm not where I live. I am just who I am inside where God lives. And so um, that was another, another thing that I had to learn is, is to risk where I, sh where I am today. And finally that day I had to tell them that my husband had lost this job and I was scared out of my mind. And, um, and they went, oh, you know, oh, we've had that experience. Of course, everybody's had some experience. And so they helped me. You know, they helped me that day. And the other thing is, is to allow your sponsor to know everything about you. You can't just hold back. And if you're having any kind of little intuitive nudges that maybe that's not okay, be sure to know that it's intuitive, an intuitive warning, and not fear. There's two different things um, because... You know, not everybody that you ask to be your sponsor is well yet. 
And um, we have to remember that we are all not well yet. And, and if you're getting some kind of little nudge inside, ask yourself if it's fear or if it's God. Ask, you know, and beware. Um, and I'm speaking from experience on this. I'm not going to share it any farther, but I am speaking from experience on this. Um, and make sure that you're involved with a group who is using the traditions. If your group is not using the traditions and you're bringing in outside literature and outside 12-step programs and, and allowing people to share from books that are not conference approved, you know, that is in violation of the traditions and it's watering down the group. And what I'm afraid of, and this is very, very selfish, my Sarah is 14 years old. She comes from a long line of alcoholism, a long line of alcoholism. And I don't know whether she's got the bad bean or not. But what I want to know is whether she doesn't have the bad bean, she is really attracted to alcoholics. She loves alcoholics. And so even if she doesn't become an alcoholic, I am absolutely convinced that she will probably marry one and she's going to need you. And selfishly, I want this to be exactly the way that it was in the beginning when I came here 22 years ago. And the only person that can that can keep it like that is, is us. We have to be willing to stand up for what we believe in, to stand up for those traditions, for stand up for the steps, to, to not embarrass anybody publicly if they, if they read something from an outside piece of literature. Take them aside afterwards. And even though your heart pounds and you get to sweat you know, all under here, it, we have to stand up for what we believe in because can you think, where would we go if we didn't have Al-Anon? What would we do? We can't get this from a church. We can't get this from any other organizations. Al-Anon is here for those of us who suffer deeply from the, the effects of the disease of alcoholism. There is no other organization anywhere that gives us what this program gives us and also re reunites us with the alcoholic, you know, to where we go from anger and resentment to compassion for this and understand that this is a disease and it's not about us. And it was such a wonderful thing. I didn't cause it. I couldn't cure it. I couldn't control it. It's not about me. My reactions to alcoholism are my responsibility to overcome. So that's, that's the thing. Um, Winnie Yeti gave me this statement a long time ago, and, it, and it's something that I am always aware of, not, and it's a, little, it's a little hostile. I have to warn you. It says, not everybody who comes to Al-Anon comes to get well. They find a fertile field of sick people they can manipulate and control. And you will find those kinds of people in Al-Anon, you know, that they are not here to get well, that they are here, you know, and they form little bunches and, and they control people and all of a sudden they kind of go off by themselves. And, and uh, we need to be really mindful of that. Um, one of the things, they told me a lot of things in the beginning that I didn't understand, like, you either grow together or you grow apart. Well, what exactly does that mean? It's telling me he should have his program and I should have my program, and then they're saying we either grow together or we grow apart. Well, it means that we need to be working these programs simultaneously, not together, and then we're growing together. Or if one of us doesn't go to a meeting and the other one does, one's going to grow spiritually and the other one's going to lag behind, and then it causes like el a more alcoholic conflict. You know, so we need to grow together or we grow apart. Our group needs to grow together or we grow apart. They told me if I couldn't couldn't keep it unless I gave it away. Couldn't keep what <laughs> unless I gave what away? Well, I couldn't keep my recovery unless I shared it. That's what that means. So there were a lot of little things that came up. Um, um, it, it, it says that the more I forgive, the less I'll resent. Oh, that was a new concept because my whole head was filled with a long log of people that I resented. And the more I began to forgive, the, more I, the less I resent. And today, today, if I'm resentful, I try to air that immediately, try to get rid of it, try to either share it with the person who I'm resentful at, share it with a sponsor, write about it, do something. I have the tools to get rid of a resentment mighty quick today because I know that a resentment makes me sick. Arbutus, wonderful Arbutus, um, she says, a resentment, she says, okay, supposing you are decided you're going to veg out today and you got on your jams and you just made a cup of 
your favorite kind of coffee and you got the newspaper and you lit a candle and you put a fire in the fireplace and you've made a decision that you're going to spend the whole day reading the paper, drinking coffee, watching a movie and just really enjoying yourself. And all of a sudden there comes a knock on the door and it's this neighbor that you really don't care for. You open up the door and you can make a decision. Should I let her in or should I not let her in? And you say, you know what, I'm really happy you came by today, but I'm, I'm going to just spend the day alone. If you'll come back tomorrow, you know, we can have coffee. And we can do that same thing about a resentment. We, have the, we, have, we are the only ones with the door, the key to the door. Are we going to let it in? Are we going to entertain it? Are we going to serve it coffee? Are we going to say, I'm busy today. I don't have time for you. I'm going to enjoy this day. I don't want, I, you know, come back, come back tomorrow. And it will. It will. <laughs> if not that one, another one, it will. <laughs> so um, anyhow, uh, there's, the, there's the how, the honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Um, there's halt, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And although I am rarely hungry, I can often be angry. I can many times feel very lonely. And Tom says, um, Loneliness just is. That was a wonderful thing. You know that we're all we all feel lonely. Loneliness just is. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to get nuts over it. This too shall pass. Um, and and the tired. I you know when we work, I get tired and I get cranky, and he gets cranky. And you know I can visualize myself as a little kid, at, like one of my little kids put a blanket over me and put my thumb in my mouth and kind of lay in the fetal position and and just leave me alone when I'm tired, you know, but if you bother me, I, I'm cranky. And um, so, and then there's the three P's, powerlessness, positive, and prayer. And there are the four A's, which is awareness, anger, acceptance, and action in that order. The awareness of whatever you're angry about is number one. And then sometimes when you become aware of what it was, you become angry and you think, gee, why did, how come it took me so long? I've been, I've been feeling crazy about this for three months and, and I could have done something about it, but I wasn't even aware that it was causing me problems. So you can feel that anger and then you have to go, okay, what can I do about it? You know, is there anything that I can do about it? And that's either the acceptance or the surrender. And then, if you figure out there's anything you can do about it, you go into action. And you, and you go into the serenity prayer. You know, is there anything um, that you can do to change the situation? Usually it's going to be about changing yourself. So, um, and I think that recovery is overcoming the fear of living. And most of the problems that we have are just based in fears. And, you know, we stay stuck because, you know, we're afraid to go upstairs. We're afraid to drive cars. We're afraid he's going to get mad. We're going to be afraid to fail. We're going to be afraid to succeed. We're going to be afraid they're going to go away. They're going to be afraid. We're going to be afraid they're going to come back. <laughs> so anyhow, those are the things that I learned in the program. Sponsorship um, <clears throat> is another area um, that is important. And I think in the program, it's like the first three steps. You know, you come to the program, you realize that you're powerless over alcohol, that your life is unmanageable. Then you come to find a God, and then you come to a place where you come to believe in that God, and then in the third step it asks that we turn our will and our life over to the care of God, and our will and our life is our actions and our attitudes, and so, you know, we begin to change. Now, the person who is going to help us change is in relationship with a sponsor. And if you don't have a sponsor, um, get one. It can be a temporary sponsor. Some people have sponsors that they have for their whole two million years in Al-Anon. I, however, have had a multitude of sponsors, and, it's, and they've been for varying reasons. Um, is a sponsor required? In my opinion, yes. I, you know, I, I just don't know how I could... I can't get along without a sponsor. I just had a... a, a an experience in June where unexpectedly my relationship with my sponsor came to an end and I want you to know that 15 minutes after that happened I had a sponsor, another sponsor, because I can't go five minutes without a sponsor. I need one. Um, it's not that I call every day. It's not that, you know, I, I can't breathe in and out without. I have to know that there's another person there that knows 
about me that can help me with their perception because mine is really grim. Um, so that's why the, the sponsor is important. How is a sponsor arranged? Well, you can go to a meeting and watch somebody that you really admire and you watch them and they say things. And in the beginning, there was a woman who came to my meeting all the time. Her name was Margie. And I loved the way she dressed and I loved her makeup and she had big hair. And when she walked in the room, everybody just kind of said, oh, Margie. And now she was never my sponsor, but when that lady walked in the room for the first several years I was in al I'd go, oh. I would be okay just because Margie was in the room. And so that might be the person you want for the sponsor, is that when she walks in the room, you go, oh, there she is, or there he is. Oh, I'm gonna f I know for this one hour I'm going to feel better. So that might be the way you pick a sponsor. I don't know. In my case, my first sponsor was arranged by my son's sponsor who said that I was interfering in his in my son's sobriety. Can you imagine? <laughs> and he called me up. Bobby called me up on the telephone and he said to me, Beverly, I have arranged for a sponsor for you. Get a paper and pencil. This is her phone number. Write it down. So I wrote down Sally and the phone number. And I says, what's that for? And he said, you are interfering in Stephen's sobriety. You need a sponsor. He says, if you knew anything about alcoholism, we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. Oh, oh my God. So I called Sally, and she was the one who I th would always tell me to blow my nose um, and that she loved me. It's going to be okay, honey. Blow your nose. And I thought blow your nose was step one, you know. And, uh, so I always knew I had to blow my nose before I called Sally. But I always called her crying. And so even though I blew my nose before I called Sally, I was always calling crying. And so she'd say, Beverly, blow your nose and then we'll talk. And so she, I'd blow my nose and she would just tell me, you know, she would just say it's going to be okay. Well, what does that mean to a newcomer? It doesn't mean a darn thing except for whatever reason it felt to me like I had been washed with warm oil. Just Sally's soft voice telling me, it's okay, Beverly, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, but, but he's doing drugs again. And she'd say, it's okay, Beverly, he's God's kid. It's going to be okay. You go to a meeting tonight. You go to a meeting tonight. It's going to be okay. That's the only thing she could tell me. I, cause she couldn't penetrate through my fears and the resentments and the clutching and all of the control that I thought. It was all an illusion. She would just say, it's going to be okay today. Go to a meeting. And I want you to know that until 1988, I went to eight Al-Anon meetings a week and two open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the only reason I'm probably still not doing it today is because I got my father who was dying of cancer and I couldn't do 10 meetings a week and could do cancer treatment and, and all, take care of his needs. And I called my sponsor and I said, oh, I can't do this anymore. And she said to me, well, Beverly, You've been going to 10 meetings a week for eight years. She says, why don't you pick a few and let's see if you really have a program. Whoa. <laughs> let's see if I really had a program. I didn't know. She said, you might be spending so much time in Al-Anon meetings that you really don't have a program. Let's see. So I, I let go of everything except Horizon <clears throat> and because I was going to Horizon Plus. Um, Louisville and friendship and open and conventions and, and you know what I found out I had a program and it was in place and it was wonderful so sponsors do things Sp sponsors are not here not to hurt your feelings sometimes if you're not getting angry at your sponsor because she had said something you don't want to hear not nasty I mean, you know, not controlling, not ugly, not nasty. But if she doesn't, if you, she gives you a perception of your behavior that you don't understand, if you don't get a little edgy, you've got the wrong sponsor because you have become friends. And sometimes that's not really a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I've had it both ways. And the sponsor that I have now, she said, um, we were talking about friendships, and she says, and, you know, in the process we'll become friends. And I said, you know what, I don't know if I want that right now. I says, I just want your, I just want you to be my guide. And I says, you know, maybe later on we'll do that. But I says, I have a tendency to see that if you get too, 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 too close, 
you, the, the, then all of a sudden the friendship, you, you think, oh, she's really, she's really nagging, but I can't say that because, we're, you know, because of the friendship. So you might want to take a look at that. What do you really need? And um, when is the time right? Yesterday. Um, but however, it's never too late because I knew a lady in California who didn't ask somebody to be her sponsor for 17 years. And the reason was she went to a woman when she was six weeks in Al-Anon and asked this lady if she would be her sponsor. And the lady said to her, I can't right now. I, you know, I have a, my plate's full. And because this woman was new and, and she didn't understand that this woman was telling her the truth, that she couldn't, it didn't have time, that she would do better with somebody else, this woman took it personally that she wasn't good enough. And for 17 years did not ask another person. So please, if you've asked somebody to be your sponsor and they says, I can't right now, it wouldn't be beneficial to both of us, say thank you so much for being honest and move on to the next person. It's not about you. You're not a bad person. But her self-esteem was so low at that time, she couldn't, she thought, you know, it was, she took it personal. Can you change a sponsor? Absolutely. I have changed a sponsor because my first sponsor didn't have alcoholic children and my son ended up going out. Uh, and when he was seven, he came in the program when he was 15 and a half, he went back out full-blown drug addict alcoholic when he was 17 and a half and I had to ask him to leave and now I was living somewhere where my sponsor had never been. And I needed to have somebody as a sponsor who had to put children out and watch young children you know, dying of the disease of alcoholism, so I had to change sponsors. My next sponsor decided that she wanted to be a drug and alcohol counselor. That's fine, but we were no longer talking Al-Anon. We were talking things that were not conference approved. She was applying the principles that she was lose, learning in her, in her KDAC um, accreditations. She was giving me that, and although it sounds alike, it's not the same, and, it, and there was a division in there, and I realized that I got uncomfortable, and so so I got another sponsor. And then I got a sponsor that was the one who um, was one of these who found a fertile field of sick people. And I got manipulated and controlled. And all of a sudden one day I woke up and I thought, you know what, this feels just like it did when I was a kid. This feels like my mom. I mean, she did some public humiliation stuff and it was really awful. And she had, was a big, you know, she it was like this big kahuna Al-Anon and I thought it was wonderful. And, and I mean, she... I couldn't do that, and it's fine for some people. Some people need that. I am not putting this down. I need tender, loving care. I, I, I have been abused and battered as a child and lived through 21, 22 years of active alcoholism. I don't need that kind of sponsorship. I need direction. I need kind, loving, honest, uncruel direction. And I, get, I make sure that's my, when I grew in my self-worth and my value, I understood that I don't need to have that kind of people in my life anymore. It was a huge growth spurt for me. Um, can you have more than one sponsor? I, I personally, personally, this is just me, I think it's a conflict. However, if, if you're a, a dual member, an alcoholic and an Al-Anon, I think probably that would be okay. You should definitely have your AA sponsor if you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And some of them would like to have Al-Anon sponsors, and I think that's the only time when it's okay to have two sponsors. But I think an Al-Anon should stick with one sponsor because then what you have is a conflict. And, and we choose the easier, softer way. So if Barbara says this and Helen says that and Helen's way seems a little easier, we are definitely going to go with Helen. And so for me, I think it's best to have one person, one perception, and one uh, path to follow. <clears throat> um, how will a sponsor help me? Oh, my God. I can't even, you know, it's like let me count the ways. I don't know what I would do without sponsorship. I mean, it's just, um, it, has been the, it has been one of my single great tools. My journal, meetings, of course, my relationship with God and my sponsor have been my great tools. Um, so anyhow, uh, the sponsorship relationships, um, they should be mutually rewarding. And when I, I got that from a workshop, I went to a woman to woman in Oklahoma one year and I was having problems with a sponsee and my sponsor says, why don't you go to the 
the two sponsorship workshops we're having this weekend and see if you can get some help. And so I'm sitting there and the word I got out of it that was wonderful is, is it mutually rewarding? If it seems to be a battle of wills or, um, you know, some people go up to me and they'll say, oh, Beverly, I want what you have. You are just wonderful. Well, then the only way to do that is to do what I do. So the first time I say to them, well, did you spend some time with God this morning? Well, I had to, I, the car, and the, no. And I, and I say, well, peace comes from spending time with God. If that's what you want, you have to spend, well, it's just always so chaotic around here in the morning. Well, let's get up a little early. Instead of getting up at six, get up at quarter to six. Spend your first 15 minutes with God. But I don't get to bed until midnight. And so when I see that there's always this kind of stuff, I'm thinking, I don't think you really want what I have because you're not willing to do what I do. Um, and I'm not even talking about spending as much time. I spend a committed hour in prayer and meditation almost 99% of the time. If you're not willing to spend 10 minutes, we're not going to be able to work together. And I have just re realized, you know, my time is so valuable, and I am willing to give from the soul if you really want what I have. But if you're not willing to go to any, any length, I really I haven't got that kind of time. You know, and the, the older I get in the program, the more I respect that about myself and about you. Maybe you're just not ready yet, and that's fine. You know, maybe your time hasn't come yet. Maybe you haven't got time to be that dedicated to your recovery, but I found from the very beginning that I had to be. I had to be. Um, learning to be a sponsor takes time and wisdom, and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I believe that every sponsee is like fingerprints. They are all different, and we have to concoct some new and, and ingenious way to, to get through to whatever it is that we're dealing with because we are all different. Our stories are different. Our motives are different. Our defects of character are the same but different. Some people, you know, our career paths are different. So I have to get to know you a little bit. And I'm going to make some mistakes. And, and, you know, I used to take that really personally. But as my self-esteem grew and I began to grow in the wisdom that I had to share, I just, you know, I have learned that everybody is different. And so as our relationship grows, I learn what I need to share with certain people. Um, being a sponsor takes unconditional love. I mean, I have got some women that I normally, we would not mix. <laughs> and, you know, and, we're, and we end up in this relationship together, and they're wonderful. Um, I ha I, no matter who you are or whatever, I have to give you complete trust. Um, I must promise you that I will keep your anonymity. And I expect that you keep mine. Um, after this last deal with this last sponsor, I have promised that you will never know who my sponsor is. Occasionally I would share who my sponsor was. I am never going to do that again. I have a sponsor, trust me. She has 25 years in the program, and um, she works a fine program, and that's all you need to know. But the fact is, is that sometimes I want to share, my sponsor told me to say or to do this. If you know who my sponsor is and you know her story and everything, I'm breaking her anonymity. And so because of my last situation and what happened in that, I have decided that I will maintain her anonymity, and I'm asking the girls to maintain mine. A lot of people ask me to be their sponsor because of what I get to do. And they think if they can go to a meeting and say, Beverly's my sponsor, then their people go, oh, oh, that's great. They don't have to even have a program. They just think all they have to do is drop my name. Or there's people in Dallas, there's another woman in Dallas who they feel if they can just drop her name, you know, then everybody knows who she is, and they think, oh, well, that's my sponsor. So the anonymity, I believe, is very important. Nobody needs to know that I sponsor them or who my sponsor is. And that's just, I'm, I, I mean, I'm just locked in that now. Um, I want to be able to share myself with you as deeply as what needs to be shared, all the good, the bad, and the ugly about me. And if I think you're going to share that at a meeting, you know, that violates me and you. Um, no matter what time of the day or night it is, if you're in crisis, please call me. Um, and, you know, I have, I have two girls right now that I'm sponsoring that are in grave crisis, and I will take a phone call from them any time. Uh, one gal is losing her husband, 
and uh, the other one uh, has a very ill husband. And so I'm, you know, I'm available for that. I mean, God, if people weren't available for me during my, my times, and I'm on this hill right now, and the reason that there's hills and valleys is so that there's people up on the top who can help the people on the bottom. And I had 10 years in the bottom. I was in that gully 10 years where people were always reaching in for me and telling me they love me and pulling me out. And they were on the hills. And I'm on the hill right now. And I am loving that place. And I am not waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> but I know someday I'm going to have a crisis. And the other shoe will drop. And I'll end up in the valley again. But there will be people who are going to be up on the hill that are going to jerk their hands up there and they're going to help me out. And I can depend on that today. I know they're going to be there for me. Um, and I hold out a first-class life. You know, and it was affirmed by my house guest who said that when she left, the only thing that she knew about me for sure is that I walked the walk. Um, I'd like to talk to you the next segment about my relationship with God, but I'm going to close this with something kind of fun. This is not conference approved, and it's things you can learn from a dog. It says, never pass up the opportunity to go for a joyride. Allow the experience of fresh air and the wind in your face to be pure ecstasy. When loved ones come home, always run to greet them. When it's in your best interest, practice obedience. Let others know when they have invaded your territory. Take naps and stretch before rising. Run and romp and play daily. Eat with gusto and enthusiasm and be loyal. Never pretend you're something you're not. If what you want lays buried, dig until you find it. When someone is having a bad day, be silent, sit close by, and nuzzle them gently. Thrive on attention and let people touch you. Avoid biting when a simple growl will do. <laughs> on hot days, drink lots of water lay on, and lay under a, a shady tree. When you're happy, dance around and wag your entire body. No matter how often you're scolded, don't buy into the guilt thing and pout. Run right back and make friends and delight in the simple joy of a long walk. Thank you. What I'm sharing with you is my own experience, strength, and hope. And if it doesn't resonate with you, if you have a different opinion from me, if you have a different idea, if your sponsor does it different, that is just fine. Every one of us who gets up here and is willing to be vulnerable and share with you is going to share with you from my recovery journey. And so please bear that in mind. I am not a representative of Al-Anon. Um, I'm, you know, this is just, um, I'm just taking you through my journey um, for uh, recovery. Um, one person came up to me and asked me if I was opposed to counseling, uh, you know, outside counseling. And when I, because I was talking about my first sponsor getting involved in counseling and then not sharing purely Al Anon, I am not opposed to counseling. I did some, some therapy for almost a year after my son died. It's very helpful. So that didn't mean that. And my opinions about sponsorship are my opinions about sponsorship. Um, and basically, they changed in June. So, you know, my last, my last uh, workshop, if I would have shared to you about sponsorship, I had a little bit of a different opinion on it then. But because of this critical situation that happened, I changed a lot of my philosophies personally about sponsorship. So, um, anyhow, on, on we go to my relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my past. When I was four years old, my mom woke me up on a Sunday morning... And <laughs> oh, that's funny. And in case you didn't know, her apple made its way all the way across here. <laughs> Anyhow, when I was four years old, my mother woke me up on a Sunday morning and she says, your Auntie Annie is going to raise you to be a Catholic. And so I, got, I was dressed, and I was sent out the back door across the alley um, to my Auntie Annie's house. And my aunt took me to church until I was um, 11 or 12 years old, and we moved to the suburbs. 
But every single morning, no matter what, on Sunday, we went to church because my Aunt Tiani was like the Murphy's Oil soap lady. I mean, she was really dedicated to the holy water and, and you know, making sure that the varnished bench, benches were highly polished. And she was one of the ladies who dusted the stations of the cross. And I'm not putting that down or making a joke out of it. She was really, I mean, she was a dedicated, trusted servant in the Catholic Church. And so... Uh, consequently, once Auntie Annie made a decision that she was going to raise me Catholic, I mean, I was a Catholic. <laughs> so I went to church. And, you know, a little girl, I, it was confusing. Um, I didn't know if God lived in the box. I was very curious to know whether the nuns had hair. I, I wanted to know whether they had handbags or if everything they owned were in these pockets. I wondered if they wore pantyhose. Um, I wanted to look under their dress, I, you know, and see if, what they looked like, if they had legs or, you know, it was just such a curious thing to me. And so, and, and I loved the, the garments that the priests wore, and I loved, I went to a church that was very much like a cathedral. It was in, in Chicago, it was marble and gold and very ornate, it was so beautiful. And it was back when they said the, the, the masses in Latin, um, and so it was, a, it was a very ritualistic thing. However, I'd get home, and then what would end up happening is um, my mom and dad didn't believe in any church, didn't have a, a God as far as I knew. And the way that I was controlled sometimes, <clears throat> because I was such a self-willed child, was um, my mother would say, if you do that again, God will get you. And then I'd come home and I'd say, oh, Mom, look, I fell off my bicycle. And she'd say, that's what God did to you for hitting your sister yesterday. So that's how it was used in my house. So then I'd go to church on Sunday and, you know, there was all this, all this ceremony around it all and I didn't know which kind, what kind of a God really lived in this box. I mean, here was all this ceremony and people seemed to be praising and adoring God and having, you know, the, the host put on their tongue and the priest blessing each person and then I would go home and my mother's telling me that God is going to get me for my bad behavior or for my, um, for my actions and my attitudes. So now I'm in Al-Anon. Um, as it turned out, I went to church. I need to tell you this. I went to church until I moved from Chicago and what ended up happening is when I got into the suburbs in West Vaughan, Illinois, I went to church on my own. And I was like driven to this thing. I was searching something. I didn't know what it was. I went to vacation Bible school, and because I didn't have very much self-esteem, I wanted to get the little star on my badge. And so I memorized Bible verses, which isn't, wasn't hard for me back then. I am dyslexic, but I have a really high IQ. And so I'd memorize Bible verses, and I'd get the little sticker, and I'd be the star student. And then I would go to the Catholic, um, to the youth organization, and to the Methodist youth or organization. And I was always involved in something, and going to church on Sunday morning by myself without Auntie Annie. Now I'm married, get ready, getting ready to marry Mr. B, and he is of the Mormon faith. And so we have this, you know, what are we going to do now? So we decided that he said to me he would be willing to get married in the Catholic Church and we'd raise, I would raise my children Catholic. He had kind of stepped out of the, the, the Mormon Church. And uh, so I went to see the Monsignor and explained to him about Mr. B's religion and what we were going to do and this and that. And he said, great, we can marry you behind the altar and you just promise to raise your children Catholic. Well, that's great. Well, then I happened to mention that Mr. B had been married before and not only that, had a child by a previous marriage. And the Monsignor went, ooh, we cannot have that here. You must leave Mr. B or, and find yourself a nice little Catholic boy. And I walked out of the office and I thought, well, I'll be darned. And I got mad. I really got angry. I remember driving home and blasting in the front door and telling my mother, you aren't going to believe this, but after all the time I've been spending in the Catholic Church, I can't get married in the church. And um, so we called up a justice of the peace made an arrangement for him to show up at 6 o'clock in my living room on, a, on the Saturday, November 11th, and I got married in my living room by a justice of the peace. I'm here to tell you it works. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, we've been, um, we, all that matters is the wedding vows, and we've managed to maintain uh, those for all these years, and, you know, whoever it is that delivers them. And so from that time until I got into Al-Anon, the Catholic Church and God, I mean, I just abandoned that whole deal and I was on self-will run riot and I was a one 
angry woman and I didn't know it. I had been deeply affected by the disease of alcoholism. I didn't know that I was marrying an alcoholic. We got married. We went off on a little two-day honeymoon, came back from Salt Lake City to Ogden. He goes to work on Monday morning and he doesn't come back for the next 22 years and he hates when I say that. But he's out there and I'm in here. <laughs> He says, Beverly, that wasn't exactly true. I was there sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, alcoholism took him away for 22 years is what I'm really saying. Um, so anyhow, um, I, I now get into the program. You know, February 9th, 1981, I'm looking at the steps on the, on the wall, and it says uh, the first two, does the second and the third step, you know, are talking about God and a higher power. And I'm thinking to myself, well, now I'm not going to be able to stay here either. And then I, I ended up staying because I was committed to 28 days of Al-Anon, whether I liked it or not, I, because I promised the treatment center people I would do that. <clears throat> so I went to Al-Anon with my intention was to stay 28 days so I could fulfill the commitment with the treatment center because they told me I couldn't go back there and see my child. Now, I want you to know, and this is not going to come as a surprise to any of you, but love dies in active alcoholism. It just does. It, it dies slowly over a long period of time, and all of a sudden one day there is more resentment and less love. And you have quit touching each other, and you have quit caring about what the other person thinks. You have quit caring about, about your own appearance and, and what they think of you. I mean, it just all dies and for each of us it dies in a different way but the fact is by the time we get here we are dead emotionally and I was emotionally dead when I got here so I am now only going to stay 28 days but what happened was because I have this incredible memory um, by the time the 28 days were up they had read the welcome and the closing and the steps and the traditions and back then, that group didn't read the concepts. But, um, you know, the slogans were on the wall. And somewhere close to the end of my 28-day commitment, I, um, I am sitting in the meeting, and I'm listening to them read the opening or the closing, and somebody missed a word. And I thought, oh, I know that word. But I didn't jump up because I knew, you know, that would be bad behavior in an al meeting. So I didn't jump up and say, oh, that word should have been. But what I know today is that that was the day I claimed my chair. And from that day, and actually I was already going to more than the two promised meetings. I was going to a lot of meetings. I was taking my lunch hour on Tuesday and Thursday and going to the Louisville group. Um, I was going to Alpha. We were going to the Main Street group at night. I mean, we were, we were going to um, Chapter 9 meetings. You, I think here in Houston you all call them Chapter 9. We call them uh, family afterward meetings. And uh, we were going to those up until the 9th or the 10th of May, George and I were still uh, affiliated with the treatment center and had to be there for a Saturday meeting. We were going to a lot of meetings. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these steps and I'm feeling something about being here. I knew, I mean, I, I would like to tell you that I knew I was home. I just wanted to stay. I didn't know I was home. I didn't know I had died of this disease. I didn't know that coming back here was going to be my rebirth that I was going to start over again and, and I was going to have a life beyond anything. I had no idea what you were all about. And think about this. If somebody like is checking out your groceries and for some reason or other it comes up and you say, well, I've been a member of Al-Anon for 21 years, they go, oh, what's Al-Anon? How do you explain that to somebody? You know, it's not really just a program that's for the family and friends of alcoholics. How it is almost impossible because each of us have our own journey, to try to tell somebody what really happens to us here. You know, if you were to say, well, I was, I was lost and then I was found and, and I, I found a God and, and, I, and, and all of these defects of characters changed into assets and, and I was this ugly... And, and they're all standing there saying, that'll be $29.50, please. I, they, there is no way that you can really tell anybody what we get here. You know, Al-Anon becomes a feeling. Al-Anon becomes a way of life. Al-Anon becomes something that once we've been here for a while, we can't even imagine how we ever did without it. And certainly it becomes more valuable because once you experience it, you don't ever want to not be here. 
So, you know, I used to listen to the old, old timers and they'd say, I, I need Al-Anon more today than I did the day I found it. And I think, well, I sure hope I don't, <laughs> you know, because that means, I would think that means they were getting sicker as time went on. But what they were trying to tell me is it becomes more valuable because they know what they would be going back to. They know what they would lose and not just friendships and, and sharing, but the spiritual growth. Because once you leave here, you're going to stop the spiritual growth too, probably. I don't know. Um, those of us are, who are here don't know what happens to those of us that don't come anymore. So we haven't got anything. All we know is we're here and we're growing. So, um, and then I'm thinking, I have to find a God. I have to find a God. How am I going to find a God? And, you know, I knew I was powerless. I knew my life was unmanageable. And then it says I have to come to believe in a power greater than myself that would restore me to sanity. And I didn't know I was insane. And insane, if you can't wrap yourself around the word insane, it's, you can probably wrap yourself around negative thinking. And insanity is negative thinking. And we were just, I mean, we were accustomed to negative thinking. So, and then it says you have to make a decision. I had never been given the opportunity to make a decision in my entire life. I had never been given a choice. And step three in big letters says, made a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understood him. So I want to go out there and say to Mr. B, what should I do? Help me. <laughs> should I turn right or turn left? Help me make a decision. I was so afraid. I mean, I'd never been allowed to make a decision for myself ever in my life. And here in big bold print it says, made a decision. Well, what is your will in your life? I don't know what my will and my life are. Oh, I'm supposed to make my very first decision to turn my will and my life over to a God that I dropped in the Monsignor's office when I was 20 years old. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so my son, Steve, who was in the program at the time, he had um, some sobriety, and he was one of those know-it-all kids because he was hanging around with people like Bob White. And... Um, and, I mean, he just threw, thought he knew everything. And he was hanging around at, you know, at Marceline and Bob's house and, he, and with Jerry and Bobby and, and Albert. And we had giants in Dallas. And my kid is in the thick of them. And, they're, and he's, he's, running, he's running with Bobby. And, I mean, he's just in the thick of recovery. And he's growing. I mean, I could see the spiritual change happen to him. I saw it happen. I didn't know what it was, but I saw the day it happened to him. And so I said to him one day, hey, Steve, um, what is your will in your life? He goes, Mom, you're going to have to find out for yourself. <laughs> I know what my will in life are, but I don't know what your will in life are. Your will in life might be different from my will in life. <laughs> and if I told you what I turned over, he says it wouldn't mean anything because it would be different for you. And I thought, I'm just going to slap him. <laughs> <I'm just> gonna... <sighs> so weeks went by. And I didn't do anything more about turning my will and my life over to the care of God because I didn't know who I was turning it over to. I mean, I don't know who I am, so how in the world am I going to figure out what I'm going to turn over to this God? I don't know what this God looks like. So anyhow, one day Steve comes back and he goes, Well, Mom, have you turned your will and your life over yet? Did you figure out what it was? And I said, Not really. And he goes, Mom, it's easy. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to give you the answer. It's your actions and your attitudes. That's all it is. We make a decision all by ourselves to turn our actions and our attitudes over to the care of God every single day. It's that simple. You do it in the morning, on your knees, in your prayer. I'm going to make a decision to give God my actions and my attitudes. Now, he is not responsible if self-will comes charging in, you know, and, and I do something obnoxious. It's not God's fault. It is my self-will run riot. So here I am with this knowledge that I have to turn my actions and my attitudes over to God. And what is God? What is a higher power? For everybody sitting in this room, God is different. And that's the, that's the wonderful glory of being involved in Al-Anon is all of, our, all of our gods can be different. Our God could be a tree, our God can be a coffee cup, our God can be a sponsor, our God can be, well, not your husband. You would not want your husband, but most of us came here with our husbands being our gods or our wives being our gods or our children being our gods. 
but they're asking us to pr turn it over to somebody who is capable of helping us make some right decisions for our life. And so I didn't know what to do because this scorekeeping God had always kept me in fear. So I had to come to believe in the power and how it happened for me. And it was just, I mean, it's a crazy little story, but it was as profound as Bill Wilson's burning bush. I mean, I'm telling you, it was that big of a deal for me. And I pray if you have not found a God of your understanding that you have some kind of a burning bush and you go, oh, oh, God cares about me. God loves me. God wants the very best for me. Whatever the higher power, whatever the God, whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. As long as you begin to understand that there is something in the universe that has that knows you by name, and God knows me by name. Sometimes, he's, sometimes he says, "Oh my." Dear, dear Beverly, you are such a spoiled brat. <laughs> you can't have everything you want. <laughs> but we're working on it, and he's doing a pretty good job. Anyhow, I worked in a bank as a teller, and I got free checks in my bank, you know, as you do. That's when, and you get a free checking account. My son worked at the Tom Thumb as a night stalker. And a lot of times by the end of the day, they would have broken, dented things cut. They'd cut with a razor blade. And it was logical because most of them were doing drugs and drinking in the parking lot, so their razor blades were not going really straight. So they had a lot of broken and dented stuff by the end of the night. So I would give my son a, a check with a date made out to the Tom Thumb and, and my signature, and then all I had to do was fill in the amounts. Was that not a little controlling? Anyhow, I, uh, and then he would buy, he had the opportunity to buy this stuff at 6.30 in the morning when they got off shift. So he knew what I liked, and so he'd buy me groceries. Well, if the check got stale dated, I would take that check from him, give him a new check with a, with a better date on it, he'd put it in his little wallet, and I would take the check rather than write void in my checkbook because I'm perfect, and I don't do void in my checkbook, I don't throw checks away, even though they're free, um, I would run over to the Tom Thumb that very day, buy milk and bread, fill in the blanks, and spend my check because I didn't like anything imperfect in my checkbook. So I have one of these checks in my, in my wallet this day, and I'm on my way over to the Tom Thumb, but I decide first to go to Walmart. And I go into Walmart, and I picked up a few things. I take out my billfold, and I write the check to Walmart and I pay for my stuff and I go out and when I get to the Tom Thumb I have my milk and bread and I go into my wallet and the check made out to the Tom Thumb is gone. Now Babs B in Dallas tells me I'm not supposed to share this publicly because it is not a good thing but one day when I was sharing the steps at Addison Group I said and I have never so much as lost a sock. Now I think Babs has six children and obviously when you have six children there's a little chaos in the house and afterwards she came up to me and she says, Beverly, don't share that publicly anymore. That is not funny. <laughs> that is very sick. So here I am, the woman who's never lost a sock and I've lost a check. So I'm standing there and of course everything I'm thinking of is, oh my God, they could buy the store, they could do this and that and the other and the bank is closed, I can't put stop payment on it. I was just frantic so I made little sticky notes and I pasted them on every register, don't accept checks so and so and I go out, finally I go home, I'm frantic, I don't know what to do, I'm trying to think maybe I could call the bank president, he could open up everything, we could start all over. <laughs> I mean, I mean, my mind is going way out there, and you're laughing because yours would do the same. <laughs> and I get home, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, Beverly, you know what? Make dinner. Do you know what? Having the thought make dinner was a surrender. That's a surrender. It got my focus off of what I was, was focused on and obsessed with, into moving into something that I had power over. I did not have power over the check. I had power over the potatoes. I had power over the pork chop. I had power over the potato peeler. I could do that. So I changed my clothes. I came in the kitchen, and I said, okay, potatoes. Reached out, get the potato peeler, and I no sooner put the potato peeler through the first potato, and the telephone rang. And it was Gracie from my bank. And she goes, hi, Beverly. And I said, yes. She says, this is Gracie. And I said, hi, Gracie. She said, did you lose something? And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And she said, I cannot believe we have people as stupid as you working for our bank. <laughs> she says, whatever possessed you to write a check to the Tom Thumb? And then, why did you do that? And I told her, and, 
And I says, well, how did you know I lost the check? And she says, well, I was in Walmart a couple of minutes, probably right after you. And Gracie filed checks for a living. And it was before they had the, the signature stamp on the back of the check where it says endorsement here. It was just a plain white piece of paper. It was pictured, you know, pictures on the front, but it was plain white on the back. And Gracie used to take checks and match the signature to the signature card in these long boxes. And Gracie had done that for 15 years. All day long, she put signature checks in the signature boxes and checked and verified the signatures. And when she saw that piece of paper, it was upside down on the floor in the Walmart by the register. She says to herself, that looks like a check. And she bent over and picked it up. And when she called me and told me she had found my check, I knew that God knew my name. And I literally slid down my cabinet onto my kitchen floor and I cried. And I cried and I cried and I cried because I had been asking God for a burning bush. Show me something big enough that I can see you. It, you know, something where I really know it's you and me. That there couldn't be any confusion that you knew my name. And I mean, that was as big of a burning bush as you could possibly get. And I slid down on the floor. And as I sat there thinking to myself, how much, uh, how, if, how, can you imagine the coincidence in that? That Gracie would be the next person in line and find my check. And then all of a sudden I began to think, I don't think this. God is showing me himself even further. He says, but look at this, Beverly. And I get to thinking, to my, you know, inside of me, I'm thinking, I never made a call about Al-Anon. I never, we never made a call about Alcoholics Anonymous. And we had two kids in recovery. I'm in Al-Anon. He's in, in AA. And we never made a phone call. We didn't even know we had alcoholism. And it was because God sent an employee of my bank to me. And she had been missing for a couple of days. And God has come to come, every, come to get every one of you, whether it's through a public service announcement from the Al-Anon service office on your television set, if it's an employee, if it's a poster in your children's school, if it's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that lives across the street. Every single one of us at some point in time was given the message about recovery. We may not have realized it. We may not have written down any phone number. But somebody came and got us who was directed by God to say, give that poor girl the message. And my fellow employee out at the, at the bank, Margaret, gave me the message. Her son almost died of an overdose. And she was missing from work for three days. And when she came back, I said, where have you been? And she starts to tell me about her son's alcoholism. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I mean, I'm not saying any of this out loud because I don't, I mean, it was the first day that that little crack in denial opened. And I visualized the pills in the washing machine and the burnt tweezers over Stephen's gear shift knob. And, the, and he, had, he had a couple of bags of marijuana in the trunk of his car. He was saving his children from going to jail. And finally somebody said, you could go to jail too, George. You need to, you need to get rid of that stuff. And so... Um, she's telling me about all these things, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, that stuff is going on in my house. And as a result of that, my husband and I made an appointment for a family evaluation at the treatment center, focusing mostly on the younger boy. And we all went there, and at the end of the evaluation, they sent us home and said they were convinced that somebody had alcoholism, but we, they didn't know who, and to go home and practice. And when we figured out who the real alcoholic was, to bring him or her back. My behavior was so bizarre, they didn't know whether I was alcoholic. <laughs> now, surely they could tell because I was so cute. Um, <clears throat> so anyhow, I am sitting there, and I'm thinking about Margaret, and I'm thinking about the, you know, I'm thinking about Al-Anon, and I'm thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm thinking about how we got here, and that the kids, you know, at that moment, everybody was sober, and I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I have a God. And so at that moment, I thought, I have come to believe. And for a moment, I had sanity. I realized that God had gifted me with this program and the knowledge that you were here. I had no idea what I was going to get from you, but that you were here for me. And that I could come for as long as I want, a day at a time. You know, it was not a big commitment. It's just a day at a time. That's all we're asked is just to come to Al-Anon or Alcoholics Anonymous a day at a time. That's it. 
And then later on I found out or I heard from a tape of a man named Gene Duffy who talked at the Spirit of Houston conference in, in the early years of that convention. And he had just returned from having a heart attack. He was a speaker who talked all over the United States and I loved him. He was a gruff, sarcastic, um, belligerent, um, alcoholic, my kind of guy. Um, <laughs> just, I love those crusty, um, he, he cussed from the podium and he was just, he was just my guy. And I could hear Gene and I loved listening to him and somebody ended up, I don't know how I got it, if it was in a tape trade, I cannot tell you how I got that tape. But I got that tape and I listened to it and he had been off the, off uh, convention speaking for one year and he'd come back after he had a heart attack and he made a talk that he never ever made again. Gene had a canned talk. No matter where he talked or when he talked, it was always the same talk. But for whatever reason, he had had a spiritual experience because he almost died apparently from this. I think he had open heart surgery. I'm not really sure. But he talked about finding the evidence of God before you came into the program. And after I had my own spiritual experience in the kitchen, I began to lay a foundation that was as solid as it could be based on my experiences where God intervened way, way before I believed in God. And today that's my foundation. And through my son's death and my husband's job loss and my father's death and the grief process that we've been through, my foundation never washed away. It was so solid. And I'm going to tell you a couple of these situations because what this is really all about is for you to relate, for you to look into your own heart and find your own evidence of God. But sometimes you go, I don't know what that looks like. And so that's why we, that's why we trade information here, so we can relate to each other. And please feel free to take what you like and leave the rest. You know, that's, I, you don't have to believe my way. I'm just sharing with you what brought me to the evidence of God that I rely on so strongly today. Um, we bought a little house through the GI Bill when we lived in Kaysville, Utah, and George and I were just newly married, probably about two years. And it, it was, you know, the wheels, the cogs and the wheels of the, of the government system move very slowly. And so months went by while they were working on our loan for the GI, on the GI Bill. And so finally the, the um, little real estate lady said, you know, if you guys want, I'm going to give you the key. You can go in there, shampoo the rugs, you know, wash the floors, clean out the cabinets, but don't paint any walls or anything until, you know, until closing, but you can get things ready. Wash the windows, you know, clean the blinds, whatever you want to do. So we did that. So one night we're going over there, and it's December 5th in Kaysville, Utah. And we had been there all night. We packed a little lunch and had a picnic and... He had a few beers and we shampooed the rugs and cleaned some things up and had enjoyed the evening and it was very late when we got home. And I don't know why it is, why he did this, but he put both of the kids in the front seat of my old pickup truck. And I had an old Chevrolet pickup truck and I don't know what year it was, but it was, you know, a, maybe a 60 or something. But it was way back when the shift was on the steering wheel and you had a manual choke. And so he's got a brand new company car, a station wagon, and he takes off in front of me and I'm following behind, and this truck is kind of sputtering a little bit the way a cold vehicle back then did. And we get, we decided to take the upper road home instead of the interstate. So we drive up, and as you approach the upper road, we were on an incline, and it was a stop sign. Well, he proceeds through the stop sign and across the four lane. Back then, they were four lanes, two northbound lanes and two southbound lanes. And we, he proceeds across the four lane, and he starts on down the highway. I go to proceed across the four lane and my truck died and I was in the two lanes of the northbound oncoming traffic and when I looked up I saw what I absolutely knew without a shadow of a doubt was a semi truck coming and I had my two little babies laying in the front seat and I began to panic and suddenly I became peaceful. I can, I, it was like I had the experience yesterday. I remember the peace that flooded over me and every thought was correct. Turn off the radio, turn off the light, adjust the choke, don't flood the car, don't give it too much gas. Be really careful when you turn it on. I could hear these simple instructions. I heard them. I heard him like, and I know today that God had moved into the front seat of my car and he was giving me directions and I tried that old truck again and, and it started up and when I went to start again, it died again. And I thought, then the next thought was don't flood it, don't get excited, I'm looking, the truck is coming closer, the 
the lights are getting bigger, I, the babies are there, all these thoughts, and you know, all of this is happening in a flash. And I thought, then try again, Beverly. It's okay, try again. Careful, adjust the choke, put it in neutral, turn it on, don't flood it, Beverly. And I got that truck going and the motor's running and I put on the gas and it went across and it crossed the two um, northbound lanes and I pulled over to the side of the shoulder and I sat there and I started to cry and I started to shake and I, I mean, everything in me just lost it. I totally lost emotional control. My husband gets out of his car, he knocks on the window and he says, what the hell were you doing? <laughs> I mean, he was scared, and you know, fear comes out in anger. Fear always comes out in anger, and and he was afraid. And and I said, the truck stalled. That went down as one of my solid bricks. My kids were little. It was the early '60s back then, and that was the evidence of God. He had sat in the front seat of my car and helped me get that truck across that four lane. And you know what? You know how close it was. I got that truck across, and that truck went by, and I felt the back end of my truck go like this, because that's how close it was. The next thing that happened is on the day I'm going to have my first child. He's alcoholic, does not want to come home from work, does not understand the urgency of a pregnancy. <laughs> And they're saying, George, go home. George, go home. And I'm calling them, saying, oh, I'm in labor. Please come home. George, go home. You know, my mother's saying, get him home. You're in labor. You've got to go. The doctor's saying, yes, you're in labor. You need to come You need to come to the hospital right now. So, I mean, all these people, but I'm calling him and I'm saying, please come home. And he's got one more thing to do. He's got one more thing to do. And so I'm standing at the door, you know, and, and I'm looking for the cars. You know, the fifth car will be him. You know, if you count to five, the red one and all that stuff. I'm doing that. And up comes the Crema Weaver milkman, and he was a young guy. And I'm standing there, and I am the biggest, I promise you, I am the biggest pregnant woman with one child you have ever seen. And it was all out in front. And I'm standing there, and I'm, and you know, I guess I must have looked frantic to the cream we were milk man. And there's a screen there, and he's got the little milk in the milk container. And he comes up to the door, and, and I open the door, and I took it, and he says, Oh my God, are you okay? And I said, I'm going to have a baby, and my husband won't come home from work. <laughs> and he said, well, you know what, lady, I've got five little children. And he says, and, and I, I'm going to tell you something. If your husband's not here in five minutes, you're going to the hospital in a milk truck. <laughs> now, I did not have to go to the hospital in a milk truck because Mr. B did, in fact, show up in that five-minute period of time. But the fact is God sent me somebody to take me to the hospital to deliver my baby. And, and it was like I was assured that I wasn't going to be all by myself. And so that was the evidence of God. Okay. Another time was when 1978 we moved to Texas. And um, he, he has been there a number of months and he's got, he's got a real estate woman and they have an agenda and she's got a bunch of houses that she's going to show me. She gives me a legal pad of paper and a pen and she says, I'm going to show you a lot of houses and by the end of the day you're not going to remember any of them. So I want you to write down details of each house so that when you're making your decision you'll remember which houses they were. So I get my little legal pad and I'm trying to keep up and I don't know how many houses we saw that day. A lot of houses. A lot of houses. And um, Anyhow, I'm finally discouraged there was not the home when you walk in it and you go, oh. I mean, even back then, before I was, you know, had any spiritual knowledge or any spiritual program, there were times when you just knew stuff. And I just didn't know anything about a house that day. I'm looking for a house. I can't find a house. can't find a house. And she kept saying to me, do you find anything you liked? And I'd say, no, it's not really. This one is nice except for, and that one's nice except for. But no one house really spoke to me. And so we're driving down. Village Estates Drive, and she says, well, time's out. You've got to go home on an airplane tomorrow. She says, I have showed you everything that I have in this price range, and you're going to have to pick a house, and he's in the back seat saying, yeah, you're going to have to pick a house, and, you know, they're both gnawing on me. Um, she eventually came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, by the way. <laughs> so, anyhow, you know what I was dealing with that day, and, um, and I said, but I can't find a house, and I don't think so. He says, well, pick something, and... Um, so we go, we're heading on down Village Estates Drive to go back to the office, and they're both telling me I had to pick something. And I said, oh, did we see that one? And she went, no, it's not my listing. 
And I said, well, I'd like to see it. And, she, and I said, could we please see it? I said, it says Century 21 on it. She said, yeah, but it's not my company. It's not my listing. And I said, oh, please let me see that one. So she pulls up into the front of the house, and she says, if the key fits their lockbox, we can go in. If not, she says, it's late. Basically, it's like, I've had enough of you. And um, anyhow, her key opened the lockbox, and we went in, and I got as far as the foyer, and I said, this is my house. Now, I don't know how I knew that. I just said to her, this is my house. It was exactly what I had envisioned. I wanted a desk in my kitchen. I wanted a split bedroom. I wanted a shower stall in my master bedroom in the bathroom. Um, and, you know, and the kids could have their own. It had a big living room and a great big country kitchen and a two-car garage and a big yard for a dog. It was everything that I wanted. And I said to her, this is my house. And um, anyhow, it turned out it was in our price range. It was available. Everything was perfect about it. And I still live in that house today. And it has served us well. You know, it, had, it was a place where, because of the arrangement, my father had his own little place down there. It was a place where the kids could be. It now holds our business, you know. And, and um, it, it, the big backyard has held two great big dogs. And, you know, the golden retriever just absolutely loves that yard. That it, I planted some seeds, and they grew into trees huge, huge trees. And so life has evolved and death, and death has happened in that house, but it's my place, you know. And on May 15th of this year, I went outside for meditation for the first time, and I really got to see what I had created in that backyard for 24 years. I mean, I had planted, I have planted everything that is in that yard, all the bushes, all the trees, everything. They're all things that between God and I, we manifested together. And, and I was, you know, I planted the seeds and God grew the plants. And, and it was just wonderful. And then the messenger I've already told you about, about getting to the program, about him sending Margaret to tell me about Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous and drunk and drug addict kids. And I could hear her. She was my friend. I could hear her. So I have these bricks. They are the cornerstone of my foundation. And every time I might feel a little wishy-washy, which in the last two or three years never happens anymore, I have total reliance on God, but it took 19 years, 18 years for me to feel totally secure. And on a, God, on a day when I'm thinking, I don't, I don't not have faith that God's not there. Sometimes I just want to see him, and I says, God, if you could just throw a penny on the ground somewhere so I could put it in my pocket. And it no sooner, just that fast, I'll turn around and somewhere laying within a few feet of where I am will be a penny. And I pick it up and I put it in my pocket. And any time I'm feeling a little insecure, I go, God is here, God is with me, God is with me. And I throw those pennies into a crystal box and then I transferred those into another big bowl that says miracles. And so I am always aware of the evidence of God. And sometimes I just need that little penny in my blue jeans, you know, and I feel it. I keep junk in the jacket pocket when I travel because sometimes it's a little unnerving to go through airports now. And I keep all this junk in my pocket. And I think, well, that came from so-and-so and this is from so-and-so. And I rattle around in my pocket and I have all this junk in there. And I feel my friendships and I feel God in there and everything. And it's just silly stuff. But you know what? It's what I do. And it makes me feel like, you know, there's days when I just need to touch something material that reminds me about the spiritual aspect of God. <clears throat> so that was my path. And, it, you know, and then my son, I, I found out that my, well, we got my dad in October, in September of 1988. In October of 1988, my son called and, and he had been in the hospital for 10 days. He says, I'm in full-blown AIDS and I'm going to die. They said, I won't live a year. And, um, and I call, and then I had taken my dog to the vet that week, and he says, Beverly, I'm going to give her one more shot. But he says, this is the last shot of magic. And he says, the next time she goes down, she's not going to come up. And, and he said, this isn't going to work again. And so I called my sponsor, and I said to her, you know what? There is no God. I'm tired now. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I said, you can take this evidence of God and all this stuff with God and all these steps, and you can just take it. And, and you know, I, I don't believe in it anymore. I said, you promised me that God would never give me more than I could handle. And I said, here I am. My, I've got my father dying of cancer. My son just calls me on the phone. He's in full-blown AIDS. He's not going to live a year. And the vet told me I'm going to lose my dog the next time she goes down. And I said, God wouldn't give me all this. I said, this is way too much. And she says, okay, Beverly, you know what? Only one day at a time. You just have to get through all this one day at a time. And you will always see the evidence of God 
In the Lord's Prayer, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. And I am here to tell you, from the day that I got that phone call until the day that I called that sponsor and she told me what to do, there has never been a day when I have not seen the evidence of daily bread. And this gal that I'm sponsoring that I'm telling you is has told you is losing her husband. I talk to her every single day, and I see the evidence of the grace of God through the daily bread, which are the people hospice, a, a nurse with coffee, a brother who came, and then he, then the wife of the brother came, and then the friends come, and the cards come, and the flowers come, and and you know just this all of a sudden you just you know she brought him home from the hospital a couple of days ago, and he you know to die. And she brought him home and some friends gathered and I says, how are you doing? And she says, Beverly, I wish you could be here. She says, I am watching a miracle. And here was this man laying in the hospital, you know, just hadn't eaten or anything for four or five days. And she said, somebody come in with a sack of ribs. And he sat down there and said, maybe I'll have just one. And they're, she says, they're laughing. And she says, and I see a smile on my husband's face. And it doesn't mean he's going to live. I mean, he is dying. There's no way. But be, when, when two or more of us are gathered, we bring life, even when there is dying. And that's what happened to me. People, people loved me and cared for me, and things happened all through that period of time where the evidence of God was there. He didn't cause my son to have AIDS. He didn't cause my dog to grow old. He didn't cause my, my father to have multiple myeloma. But what he says, and I heard this through another speaker, is he will receive them, and in the meantime, I will give you daily bread. And that's the promise that I got. It wasn't going to mean that I was going to cure my dad, cure my husband, or make my dog back to being just a puppy. But I was going to get daily bread, and, and that's exactly what happened. But what the sponsor says is, I don't believe in that journal you write in, but she says, as long as you do with that, every day that's fine with me but at the top of the page I want you to write something you're grateful for or somehow that you have seen the grace of God manifested in your life that day and I began to do that she says I don't want you to write another thing on that page until you write down how you have seen God work in your life that day and I promise you that that is how I got through the the, the next um, from 1988 until 1993, was to become acutely aware of how God was working in my life. It wasn't to throw God away and say, no God that would love me would do this to me, because God didn't do it to me. He asked me to participate. He loved me so much, he gave, he gave me the opportunity to participate in my father's life, in my son's life, in my dog's life. I mean, we are given wonderful opportunities. And so the dog came first, and I held the dog, and I felt her life go away. And I walked out of there knowing that if I could hold that dog while she died, I was capable of holding my father and my son. And that was the gift I got that day. God is so good to us here. But we have to learn to look. Look for the ways that God manifests himself in, in our life and how he's telling us, I'm here. I'm here. I love you. I know your name. And that's how it goes. So... In, the, in, in finding a God, we, we are gaining spirit, spirituality. We have to understand the importance of ritual, of doing the same thing over and over as far as our spiritual life, to take time every day to acknowledge a God of our understanding, to take a moment every day to get on our knees. And I roughhouse, after I pray and meditate, Logan, all, I, I always say to her, get in your corner, and she lays on the corner of my bed. She's 80 pounds, and she's just a wonderful, big old fuzzy dog. And some of you have met Logan. She comes to some conferences with us. And anyhow, she lays there, and when we're done, I, I put my book bag down, this is my book, and I go over there, and I say, I'm going to get you. And then we do scratch and rub and poke and snarl and blow snot and just do all kinds of stuff. And then I go, shh. And that dog will lay in the middle of whatever pose she's in. She lays there like, you know, like a statue. And I get out of bed and I get on my knees and I do have a little ritual of prayer that I do that I have developed only for myself. It's stuff I put together. I've read non-conference approved books, conference approved books. You know, the AA 12 and 12 has a wonderful meditation in there. There's lots of resources. We don't have to stick to conference approved stuff when you're developing your prayer and meditation time. Some people sit quiet. Some people like to listen to music. Some people take walks. Some people ride in cars. 
Some people sit outside. Some people sit in their bed. You know, some people are quiet. Some people close their eyes. Some people open their eyes. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you are communing with your higher power at some point, and it's better to do it at the same time every day. So I have my little prayer ritual, and Logan lays there in whatever position she's in, and then when I'm all done, she knows I'm done. I don't have to go, okay, she knows we're done, and she starts all of the other, the other nonsense. But she is in tune to my ritual. And when I decided to go outside to pray and meditate on May 15th, she was miffed for two days. It was like, what about the corner, Mom? And what about the books? And what about Dad bringing the coffee? I mean, she was just like in a frenzy. On the third day, she woke up at 3, I'm not kidding, 3.30 in the morning. She had decided it was so much fun, she wanted to start earlier. <laughs> so it took us two or three days to get her into the thing. I don't go out there till 6.30 or 7, Logan, not any earlier than that. And then I promised myself, I promised myself I was going to sit out there as the weather turned cold. I had all this stuff. I made a shawl. I was going to use a sleeping bag. I got some afghans. I lit a, have a little candle out there. I have all my little stuff out there. I was going to sit in there in the cold. I want you to know I do not like to be cold. <laughs> so God's going to have to wait until April. And I went back to my old ritual of sitting in the bed, and then Logan was miffed again. It was like she was enjoying being out there. But I want you to know something. She is so in tune to the time of peace that we had a wild rabbit come within 10 feet of her and she knew it was there and she never moved. She never moved. She didn't move when the squirrel came up on the patio. She didn't move when the red bird came up and normally she's a golden retriever. She loves chasing squirrels up trees but she never moved during that period of time of prayer and meditation. As soon as we were done, and I pray, I rubbed her belly out there, did all this stuff. As soon as I was done, it was a free-for-all for the neighbor cats, the squirrels, the rabbits, everything. But she never moved. So if you don't think that what we do doesn't impact our children, our spouses, our pets, it does. But most of all, it's an impact on our own life to be able to have such a dedicated routine, such a dedicated ritual that the dog got it. That tells you in itself, we don't fool around with this. It is a fact of life at my house. And so um, I have my routine, and it's a definite routine. I pray on my knees. I do the third and seventh step prayer. I have some spiritual books, conference approved and not conference approved. Um, <clears throat> I... Um, I list three things that I'm grateful for. I write in my journal, and um, and so I have a committed, I have a committed time, no matter how small. Um, here's a challenge: think of some of your own past experiences and begin to build the foundation if you haven't got one. It's so important. My relationship with God is still growing. Um, I still try uh, strive for complete faith and trust, but I'm human and I fail. And that's where I have to cut myself some slack with this relationship with God. I am the only one who keeps score about my behavior and my failures and my successes. But see, God doesn't see failure and success. He just cheers me on saying, you tried. You know, you tried. That's all that really matters. I'm the one who judges me. My self-worth, my self-value is is tied up in the tasks and, 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 and so I have to quit judging I have to quit judging my life because I can't see me the way God sees me he sees what we have heard before the tapestry he sees the front of the picture I see all the knots and tangles and untied pieces and the goofy colors that don't seem to blend but God sees the front and he sees how it's all unfolding and he is so happy with me for just trying and um so then, God is my life, um, and I know the power is, and I know it is there for me. And as I grow spiritually, I am more aware of the evidence of God, and I don't take anything for granted. Um, one of the other things that I have learned here is that I always trusted people and loved God, and I was taught here to trust God and love people. And the reason for that is people have clay feet, and they're going to disappoint us. But we get to love them no matter what. But we always have trust in God. Always have trust in God. And I have that backwards. It took me a, about a year to get that to where I loved people and I trust God. <clears throat> in the big book it says that God is either everything or he is nothing. 
and I think that is just, I mean, that's basically what it has to be. I mean, there's no middle of the road with your belief in this God that you have, that we're asked to come to believe in. It is either everything or it is nothing. Um, there's been more things which I choose to call either epiphanies or eternal instances. Um, one year we went to Newport, Oregon, my husband and I, on a little trip, and they had just opened up a new aquarium, and we decided we would go. And it was the opening weekend, and they didn't have a lot of the tanks filled, but anyhow, they had some beautiful displays in there, and we went into a room that was a very solitary room with a huge glass cylinder in the center, and it went from floor to ceiling. There was no plant life in there. There was nothing. It was just filled with jellyfish, and on the floor were lights of pastel colors, and on the ceiling were lights of pastel colors, and nothing in between, just this huge glass cylinder. And I sat there, and I looked at the jellyfish. What I, what I had only seen jellyfish dead on beaches, and they say, don't step in them, they bite, you know. And so they're ugly, and they're slimy, and they're masses and everything. But when they are in a tank in their natural environment, there is absolutely nothing more gorgeous on planet Earth than a jellyfish. And they had little ones and big ones, and as they, as they went around, they swim like this. As they went around the, the aquarium, and they went through the different lights, they turned peach and pink and green and blue blue and yellow and all these beautiful colors and I sat there and all of a sudden I became overwhelmed and I cried and I cried and I and wept and the tears ran down my cheeks. The beauty just was just more than I could behold and my husband saying, would you please stop that? <laughs> Everybody's looking at you, Beverly. Beverly, please don't embarrass me in front of all these people, <laughs> all my good friends. And I, it was like, even though he was unhappy with what had happened to me, it didn't break the connection, that I, the spiritual connection that I was feeling. And I'll bet I stood there 20 minutes. Now, here's the deal. I'm a photographer, so when I see something beautiful, I right away want to snap a picture of it so I can remember it forever. And what I have learned here is as good as I am, at my photography, and I am an excellent photographer, as good as I am, sometimes the most beautiful pictures don't work out. And as I tried to take the pictures of these, of these um, jellyfish in this tank, my pictures didn't work out. And I got home and I was so disappointed because I wanted that feeling to come back. And somebody said to me, Beverly, sometimes we just have to make memory pictures. And so I make memory pictures of sunsets and sunrises because they don't always turn out, but I remember them in here. So that was one of them. I, um, I, one of my epiphanies was holding my second grandchild when she was born, just minutes after she came out of the womb. I thought, oh, you know, I am so blessed. And I have such a relationship with that middle child. Oh, I have a relation, real a incredible relationship with the one that's here. But this middle one, is di it's different. It's different. Um, I remember the spiritual experience that I had on the very moment that my son drew his last breath. It was an incredible spiritual moment. And, you know, and who would have ever thought that? But I was in tune to the God of my understanding, and I saw what happened to my son when he left. And it was an incredible spiritual moment. Um, listening to speakers... And not all of them speak to my heart, and, and I'm always surprised at when something will, but conferences and conventions and listening to speakers has always been a huge path to my recovery. I remember things. And so sometimes, you know, they'll touch on something. So just as I've done here, I've watched some of you laugh, some of you weep. We touch each other. And so that's another way. I remember the day that I went and picked out Logan. She was only two days old, and they painted this fingernail, and um, that, was, that was my Logan. They ended up, she was the biggest dog in the litter, not the biggest female, but the biggest dog. And we got to have visitation, and we watched her grow, and we finally were able to pick her up on her eighth week and, and bring her home. They, they um, said that a dog becomes a dog the last two weeks that they're with the mother, and so they have to be with them until they're eight weeks. And, and I couldn't hardly wait to get her, but, you know, she's just been magnificent. So I was there, and I picked out this puppy. There was a day when I'm driving in my car, and Sarah is a little girl, and we had her a lot when Scott was dying, and she has the longest brown eyelashes and huge big brown eyes you've ever seen. She's 
beautiful little girl. Anyhow, she's sitting in the car and she's got the safety belt on and the sunroof is open and we're driving. She loves Michael Crawford and he, all the songs from the Phantom of the Opera and from a time that she was little, we would play Michael Crawford and sing the songs to the Phantom of the Opera and it was just wonderful. And, and one day we're driving down the road and I look at this little girl and I see those long eyelashes and the beauty in her face and I had this feeling of love come into my being and I never realized I was so capable of loving anybody that deeply. I loved that little girl and I looked at her and I, you know, it was just, it just, it just overwhelmed me how much I loved that little girl. And then a few days later we were driving down the road again and I had fixed her a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and threw her in the front seat and I said, here, eat while we're driving. And she ate and got half a sandwich done and she goes, Nanny, I'm not very hungry for this other half. Now this is so unlike me. I says, oh, that's okay. And I reach over, I grab the other half a sandwich and I throw it out the sunroof. And her eyes got as big as saucers and she went, Nanny, what did you do? And I says, God loves peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Can you imagine, I'm the woman who has been eating for the starving children in China and I throw a half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out the sunroof of the car. And so I, she was like in awe you know, that I did that. And um, I have always been moved to tears when somebody sings Amazing Grace. But I want you to know that uh, in September I was at a, convent, a woman's convention and a Native American woman sang Amazing Grace in Navajo. And I want you to know I've never seen or heard anything so beautiful because she did kind of a sign language with it. And I, the hairs stood up and my tears were flowing down. And I was just, and I looked around the room and I thought to myself, you know, all of these women, there were 350 women sitting in that room, all in recovery. And there was this woman who says, I have a gift from you from the Navajo Nation. And she sang, you know, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And then there was a song that a woman sang at another woman's conference and she was singing and it was called I Can See Clearly Now. And it was at the time when I was getting, coming out of my, my grief for my child. And the songs in there, the words to that song are so beautiful for somebody like me who's coming out of grief. And I sat there and I started to cry and they didn't understand why. But when I have been moved to tears emotionally, I'm in a transition. You know, usually I'm in a transition either into loving or more spiritual growth. But it says in there, you know, I can see clearly now this, the clouds have gone. You know, there's nothing but bright skies ahead. I can see clearly now. You know, it's just, I don't remember it all. I used to, I had it written down and I don't know if it's here or not. But the fact is most of you have heard the song and it doesn't really matter. But um, the girl says, oh, I didn't mean to make you cry. And I said, you didn't. I says, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of joy today. I says, I think that I am finally being able to see through the pain of the grief, which took a long time for me to get through. And I could see clearly and there was nothing but blue skies ahead. And from that day until today, I've been on this mountain and I am so grateful to be where I am today. Um, and then there's the deal where you're thinking of somebody and they call on the phone or they drop you a card and today with the electronic thing, they'll send you an, e an email, you know, and say, I was just thinking about you today, Beverly, how are you doing? You know, and you write back and say, thank you for thinking about me. I love you too. And that was the, and so um, come to believe in the circumstances and ask yourself if you really believe. You know, have you really come to the place where, you know, like it says in step two, came to believe in the power greater than yourself that can restore you to positive thinking. That, and positive thinking is just an amazing thing and it takes practice. We are people who normally do not think positively. And so are you thinking, you know, have you begun to be restored to sanity? Um, and I'm not going to go into the self part. Um, it's a little early. Um, I don't know, I guess we could break for lunch. And um, I've got 10 minutes to 12, and I don't know how long they're planning for lunch, but I'm thinking about an hour. So perhaps um, we could break for lunch, and we'll come back at quarter to 12. Is that good? <laughs> quarter to one. Quarter to one. Sorry. I really have my clock set on. Is that good? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening, and we'll see you in an hour. For the next four or five days, I'm going to talk about me. <laughs>
which is my relationship with myself. And no other relationships can really work until I have a relationship with God, a relationship with the program, a relationship with myself, and then finally I can begin to have some, some fairly healthy relationships with my husband, my sister, my brother, uh, my children, you know. But I've got to know who I am. Um, I've got to know I've got a God. I've got to know about my home group. And then I get to start to recover um, for myself. And that's when things really begin to happen, when things really uh, take on a, a, just a whole new dimension. <clears throat> so anyhow... Um, I first of all had to understand at a deep level that the Father within doeth the work. And within means God lives in me. And I believe that today. He's not out there. He's not um, in it. You know, he, is, he is, dwells within me. And um, that's just a comfort beyond anything I can even imagine. My journey is still in progress, but I like myself today. But I want you to know that I suffer from one of my main character defects is inappropriate behavior. Open mouth, insert foot is my logo. Um, I just do that. And I've, I've had that problem since I was a little child. When you're raised in an alcoholic home, you will do about anything to get attention. And it's kind of subconscious. I did never set out to be anything but a cute little kid, you know, and, and do my mother's will. But... There was no attention in an alcoholic home, so I just took on this thing with this inappropriate behavior. And I became loud and animated and bigger than life. And then when I couldn't get my mother's approval, I enhanced my stories, told, made myself bigger. You know, if it was five cents, I told her it was a dime. If I found a penny, I told her it was a dollar. If I, no matter what it was, I made it bigger, thinking that she would, I, I could get her attention mostly. And it didn't work. And so I started to do this outside the home with my friends. I became bigger than life and a storyteller, and a lot of people thought I was just the cutest thing they'd ever seen, and they loved me, and I had this whole little pastel of people that followed me even in my childhood. And then I had people who said, you know, you have a big mouth. Um, <clears throat> you're a blockhead, and uh, your children need to be seen and not heard. So there was this, the two sides. So... Um, it was working on the outside, but it wasn't working on the inside of my house. So I have this problem today where I still get myself in trouble um, because I say things inappropriately, and I did that about a month ago. So, I mean, I had to write a letter. I, it was somebody from the East Coast, and I had to write a letter and say my, I'm still a work in progress. My behavior was terribly inappropriate when I said this. I, you know, I was trying to be funny. I didn't realize that it could be offensive. And what I got back was, you are forgiven, I am like you, and thank you for reminding me to keep, uh, keep my, my, uh, my character defect in bay as well, because she said, I have been lax in that area. So, you know, she forgave me, and she said, thank you for giving me the opportunity to take a look at myself. So, you know, I'm not ashamed of who I am, and I'm really happy to be able to share things with you, because I am a work in progress. So... Um, there's a movie, um, and oh, I'm so bad about movies. I see about two a year if I'm forced. And um, <laughs> but one of them, oh, Sabrina, Sabrina. Okay, she goes off to France and gets involved with photographers and their photographing models. And she meets a mentor along the way. And the mentor told her to write in a journal and said to her, "You will find yourself in a journal." Now, long before I saw the movie Sabrina. I started to write in a journal because Jean Coffin, who was really my hero in Alcoholics Anonymous, she was brassy and loud, and she had bracelets, and they jangled, and she wore jeans to work, you know, colored jeans. But she had this huge, big purse, bigger than that, and her cigarettes were always in the bottom. And, and she, had a, she was from West Texas, so she was, had that wonderful, um, they're, they're, they're yarn spinners, you know, the old... Oh, that we're losing that, yeah, that wonderful, our, my generation and the, my children's generation, they don't know how to spin yarns, but those old people, they could spin yarns. They could tell a four-hour story about how they lit the, how they lit the, the, the logs in the, in the wood-burning stove, and, and you'd either be crying or laughing because they just had a way of telling stories. Well, Jean was like that, and I loved her, and I would have walked to the moon if Jean told me that that was my path to recovery. And Jean believed in writing in a journal. And she sponsored a lot of women and men in Dallas. And because she was Mama Jean, you know, she was just Mama Jean to everybody, 
but she had this wonderful way of, of, want, of without even flaunting herself, of making you spiritually want what she had. And she always made her girls write in a journal. She would say, if I'm going to sponsor you, you're going to write in a journal. And so I started writing in a journal because I wanted what Jean had. And one day I lied at work and I said, I'm going to go to the dentist this afternoon. Uh, and, I, and I ended up going to, to where Jean worked and we had lunch together and we went in her office and I said to her, you can read my journal, any page, I'm not a, you know, this is between us. And she looked at it and she burst into laughter, only the way Jean Coffin could burst into laughter. And I'm breaking her anonymity because she has, she has been gone for quite a number of years, but she left her legacy in my soul and, and she just burst into laughter and I said, well, what's so funny? And she says, there's not a feeling on this page. She says, you're writing this journal like if it's a little high school journal. You know, I went to the grocery store. I saw Tracy at the meeting tonight. I had mashed potatoes and gravy for dinner. I, you know, it was just this. And, and she, she sat there and she wrote me a mock journal page. She says, if, if I was writing it, she says, I, I put on the top of the page, dear God, and I date it. And then um, she put down a high feeling and a low feeling. And so she says, she talked about her boyfriend. Um, she was in her 70s and she had her boyfriend. And anyhow, she says he made her mad that day, except Jean, would, she'd cuss right in her letter to God. She said, God knows I cuss. And I don't have to. So she just, but Tom made her mad today. And because he did this, and then I reacted to him and I said that. And I don't like when I react to Tom. And then she says, my high feeling is on the way home, I got off the highway and I stopped at Brahms and got a double dip ice cream cone, which made everything okay. And so, um, so my challenge was to find myself in my journal and to be honest in there. First of all, I was writing in the journal thinking that if I died and George read it, that you know I did, certainly wouldn't want him to read anything that was in my journal. And then I thought, shoot, what if we die together in the Bubba truck and, and my kids read my journal? I certainly don't want to be writing anything in there that you know Stephen or, or the girls couldn't read. And so I was writing in my journal with the idea that if anything happened to me, then they read it, I wouldn't want them to know. And then I thought to myself, this is ridiculous because the whole idea of finding myself in writing in these pages was to be honest. So at some point in time, I don't know when it was, I began to write honestly about how I felt in my journal. And I truly began to find myself in the pages of my journal. Um, I found myself in uh, uh, other people's defects of character. And you see, instead of judging, uh, you know, what if, what if Joan and I were in a meeting and she did something that was just ridiculous? And instead of sitting there thinking to myself, well, Joan has 20 years in Al-Anon. I can't believe she's still behaving like that. Well, then my sponsor says, with there's one finger pointing at them, there's three pointing back at you. And then somebody else says, if you spot it, you got it. You know, <laughs> we hate all these little one-liners. So then all of a sudden I have to take a look at that behavior and I think to myself, well, I need to look at that rather than judge it. Is God showing me Joan's defective character so I can realize that I have it? or I can make a decision about who I want to be or who I don't want to be. And most of the time that's what it is, is that we are out there not displaying our character defects to each other to be obnoxious, but, but the people who are watching us in our character defects and our character assets are making decisions about who they want to be and who they don't want to be. And once I realized that it wasn't a judgment call, that you were neither right nor wrong, that I wasn't right or wrong, because I find all the time that you and I don't agree on the way that I think. I mean, I thought I had the only way, and, but I, find out, I found out this week I, am, I don't think the way my friend in Nevada thinks about a topic. And so um, it was come as a complete surprise to me because I, when I think something, I think you all think it that way too, but then I find out that you and I don't think the same and that I'm kind of, but what it is, it's an evaluation. It's a spiritual inside evaluation. So I can look at Joan and say, God, thank you for letting me see that about Joan because I can make a decision that I'd like to correct that defective character or, oh my God, that looked awful with Joan wearing it. I certainly don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to have that. So then I have this choice. But it's not about calling up somebody and say, you should have seen the way Joan behaved in the meeting today. You know, it's about saying, thank you, God, for letting me see that. 
because those are spiritual lies. And I can either I can either choose to be that way or cho- choose to disregard it. But the fact that I spotted it, I got at it, you know, and so that's the way that it is. So bad examples help me as well as good examples. So I praise the bad examples in my life and say, oh, thank you for being a jerk. (laughs) I get to see that I don't want to be a jerk. Thank you for, you know, especially I get to see people in airports. Oh, my goodness. The worst worst of the worst shows up in airports. People are restless, irritable, discontent. They think theirs is the only agenda, you know. And so I watch people act in airports, and I want you to know that if you go up to a, a, a ticket agent, when, when they've had all kinds of cancellations and I, and I say to her, could I get you a glass of water? They're like stunned, you know, but I want you to know I get on a plane and I get the seat I want. And I don't do it like that, but I think to myself, if I was, if I was being, um, you know, one of God's kids and, and I was as busy as this woman's been, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody brought me a glass of water or even was concerned about the fact that I might be tired? And I'll say to him, I bet you are so tired of all this. You could just, I bet you can't wait till you get off work today. And just that somebody has acknowledged their predicament. They are so happy about that. And so I do that all the time. Um, I have, the sponsor I have now has this fetish about grocery carts in uh, supermarket parking lots. And, um, and I just hate that woman. Just every time I go into, and I have, I am blessed by having a neighborhood Walmart store one mile from my house. So I'm in there every day, and it's just wonderful. It's just a wonderful little store. I don't know if you all know about them. They're tiny little grocery stores that don't sell anything else but some groceries. And I'll get out there, and I always park my car kind of in the back for two reasons. I don't like it. I don't want it to be scratched. I always have the dog out there, and... They said exercise is good. If you park far away, it gives you an opportunity to walk a half a block in and a half a block out. So I think, okay, that's a good way for me to exercise. So I always park my car way out there. Well, when you park your car way out there, the return slots for the shopping carts is not where I park my car. And so it's days when the wind is gusting and there's trash blowing all over the parking lot. And I'm thinking, I don't want to return this shopping cart to there. I'm going to just kill her next time I see her, you know. (laughs) But... I think I hear her voice in there, return your shopping cart to the thing. So I do those little simple things. The other thing that I heard, you know, is to always, you know, the gal, I love Bonnie. Bonnie's my checker. We also have automated checkouts. So sometimes if I don't have a lot of produce, I'll use the automated checkout. But when you have to start punching in all the numbers or identifying your bananas, (laughs) I think that's way beyond my patience level. And so I go to Bonnie. And, um, you know, we're on first name basis. And um, one day uh, we made a joke across there and this lady looked at me because she didn't realize that I wasn't being, that Bonnie and I had this little thing about marking the end of my groceries and the beginning of the other ladies. And we laughed and she says, and this lady looked at me and she said, that was rude. And Bonnie says, no, she's my favorite customer and we have a thing going. And so... um, Anyhow, yesterday or a couple of days ago, I was in there and Bonnie was walking through one of the aisles and and I said to her, well, I can hug you today because we haven't got a cash register in the middle of us. And she was like stunned and we just had this bear hug and she says, today's my birthday. And I said, well, happy birthday. I said, today's my anniversary. So it was Monday. I said, today's my anniversary. And I mean, this is just my checker at the neighborhood Walmart grocery store and we have this little thing going all because... I've been uh, conscious of the fact that she stands all day. And I tell her, I always tell her, I appreciate you so much, you know. And then she'll say, well, I appreciate you too. I always look forward to when you come in the door. And you know what? It's a simple little thing, but that's how I work my program. I put the card away. I don't cause any trouble in the store. If I pick something up and I don't want it, I put it back where I got it from. I don't leave it in there. This is another one of those little sponsor things. She says, if you pick up the ham and you don't want it, you don't leave it in the toilet paper section. And so we have to, I have to do those things. I can hear her voice just nagging me in my head. You know, if you're in the big store and you pick up the blue jeans and you don't want them, you don't leave them in the tide, you know. And so, um, and I used to do that kind of stuff all the time. You know, it's just, it was just the way I did life. Who cares? They have people to go around, put this stuff away. What big deal is it? And then I hear my sponsor's voice in my head said, I have to put the, I have to put the card back. So um, through my grief, I gained great wisdom. Who would have ever known that the gift of grief was going to be wisdom? 
but I have wisdom. I'm not intelligent, I'm not brilliant, but I have living skills today that I could not have gained any other way than to lose my child. And it's not that I wanted it that way, but it's one of the things that I am most grateful for is that the process of all that gave me great wisdom. And I have wisdom to share with other people based on experience, not that I've read a book by Emmett Fox or somebody else. I have great wisdom because I lived life and it's my gift. It's the gift that I got back from that. So, um, and I found myself through the love of the people who entered in and out of my life. And there was a man in California that I, I related to so much when I was new in the program. His name was Bobby. He was an alcoholic, and he was a madman at the podium. But that man described my insanity. And there were several, those of us, those of us who are like me also listen to Bob. The ones who aren't like me go, that man's crazy. <laughs> and, but I heard him, and he, he always would say, God puts people in your life when they're necessary, and he takes them out when they're no longer useful. Our thing is, is we don't want to let anybody go. And so I have been allowing people to transition through my life and saying, oh, there you are, and then, bye, thanks. You know, I appreciate it. And some people have stayed forever. I walked into my group when I first went to Friendship three years ago, and there was a tall, thin, blonde girl there, and I looked at her, nothing special. She's just a, just a really a, a, a tall, thin, blonde girl in, in her early 40s. And when I walked in the room, there was something inside of me that just jumped for joy. And I went and hugged her, and I says, I'm Beverly, and I says, I'm new to the group. And she says, well, she gave me her name. And um, anyhow, I kept hugging her and thinking we could have conversation. And it seemed like she was avoiding me, and I thought, well, maybe I'm mistaken here. Well, later on, I found out that when I when I found this gal, she was brand new in the program, and she says, "You scared the, you scared the, you scared me." You know, and she said, I, I'm thinking, who is this aggressive woman? We are such good friends today, and we go over to Mama's diner, Mama's daughter's diner, about once a month, and have a breakfast together. And uh, we talked about it the other day. I said, you know, when I saw you, my little soul said, oh, there you are. And she said, you know what, I thought that too. And then she said, but I didn't realize that you weren't new. And then when I found out you had a lot of time, I was intimidated and everything else. But the fact is, I don't know how long we're going to stay in each other's lives, but I thoroughly enjoy her. There's no strings attached to the relationship. It's mutually rewarding. We laugh. It's not all program and dreary stuff. And um, I just adore her, you know. And, um, and I, have, I have people, um, I, I met a gal about a year ago, and I thought this, this friendship was going to work. And, and we pursued it and did some things together, and there was this little thing inside of me that kept, like, this isn't okay, this isn't okay, and I couldn't figure it out. And then I went to my sponsor, and I said, Do you know, I think even though I have this much time and I have all this experience, I said, I think there's a part of me that still will not let people in. And I said, this gal is kind of, you know, we're kind of working on a, putting a friendship together. And I said, I just won't let people in. And she says, well, let's kind of just keep an eye on this. Well, come to find out, something happened, and I got a little email from her. And um, it was very accusing. It was untrue. And I thought, oh, maybe this thing about intuitively knowing how to handle things that used to baffle us is the reason why I don't let everybody in. It might be the little warning signal that we're going to be friends for a while, but it's not. there's going to be something to be learned here. And that's what it was about this girl. And I thought that was the, that was the barrier. I called my sponsor back, and I said, you know what? It's not about me. I said, it's the little warning of God inside of me that says, beware, <laughs> you're going to learn something here. <laughs> and I did, you know. And so I'm, I'm more open to, to these things. This sponsor thing was a killer. I grieved in my backyard for six weeks during the summer. I didn't intend for this friendship to come to an end. And it was, a, it was oh my God, it was sad. I was so sad. And I thought, well, I learned a lot from her. I had her. She was my sponsor for nine years. She helped me through all of those beginning stages of, of trying to stay married to George and grieve my son's death at the same time and living with somebody who was grieving. And we were really a mess. We were a mess. If you would have looked at us, you would have thought, there's no way these two people are going to make it through this. 
and statistically, this is not conference approved, 75% of people who lose children statistically do not stay married. And we survived. So if you look at the statistics and they're saying 75% of people do not stay married when they lose a child, that means there's trouble in paradise. Big trouble in paradise. So we had trouble, but we stayed together. And I thought to myself, isn't that just an incredible deal? So um, <clears throat> anyhow, about more about me. I grow to know, my, I grow to know myself and, and take time, and I'm patient with myself. My growth is slow. Um, one of the things that I had to do that was very important to me is that I had to list five things about myself that I did not like before I came into the program. And of course you don't know what those things are, but five things about myself that I did not like before I came into the program. And then you have to also think to yourself, have you accepted yourself exactly the way you are right now? Hail damage? You know, the wrong color hair, a little cellulite, you know, uh, you would, all of us always seem to think we want bigger boobs and sh smaller rotundas and, you know, and all this stuff about us. We can't seem to look in the mirror at, without trying to fix, think, you know, if, if I, I'll cut the bangs, um, maybe I'll get littler glasses. When I'm 63, I'm going to get this, my turkey things fixed. And, you know, I just do all these things, you know. I have to look in the mirror and know that I am exactly the way God made me. And somebody told me early on, God didn't make junk. God didn't make junk. And I'm certainly not the first piece of junk that he made. He created me in the image and likeness of himself. And I'm not junk. And so I have to accept everything about me exactly the way it is right this minute, cannot look in the mirror um, in my birthday suit and try to rearrange parts, body parts. And um, so, five things you have done to change who and what you are. Um, five things you like about yourself. I am here to tell you that probably more than half the people sitting in this room cannot list five things that they like about themselves. But it's really important to be able to do that, and they can't be pretty insignificant. If you can, if you can sit down and list five things, make them pretty significant, you know, about who you are and what you like about yourself. Um, have you gained any inner peace and serenity yet? Are there even moments... When I first gained inner peace and serenity, it was such a new feeling, I thought I was depressed. And I called my sponsor and I says, I think I'm going through a severe depression. And I says, I think probably I need to see somebody because I maybe need some medication. I says, I, and she said to me, we talked about it a little bit, and she says, maybe you're just experiencing serenity. And I said, do you think? It was such a new feeling for me, I couldn't identify it. I was always in total chaos. And I kept an eye on it, and I thought, you know what? This could be what peace feels like. I don't know. If I'm depressed, they'll tell me. Somebody in your group will always tell you, I think you're depressed. But they didn't tell me that. You know, most of the time people would say, considering what you've been through, you are doing so well. You are so doing so well. So I think I have friends in my program that if I was depressed, they would have said, you know, maybe you need to seek out some professional help. Nobody ever said that. I was experiencing peace and serenity, and it was a big deal. I didn't know what it felt like. Do you acknowledge your intuitive voice? My sponsor that I just terminated relationship with used to say to me, Beverly, you have the strongest intuitive knower I have I've ever known in anybody and she said and on the other hand you absolutely refuse to pay attention to it <laughs> refuse so I'm trying to listen to this little still small voice inside of me which is always accurate and it's always leading me to my good and and I refuse to listen so um, and do you have a relationship with your higher power when I was new in the program, I went to a convention. It was called the Irving Spring Conference, and um, there's, it's still going on now, but if all of you who are familiar with Joe and Charlie who do the big book studies, um, no, it wasn't him. It was, it was um, Joe R. from Louisiana. 
it was Joe or okay after he finished with his talk he used to bring these little cards and lay them up on the podium and on one side of it was this prayer from Thomas Merton and on the other side was a man walking it was just a silhouette man walking on the beach and it was it said dear God um, thank you for all that you have given me all that you have taken away from me and all that you have left me and my husband and I through his sponsor's direction began praying at our meal time about 15 years ago because um, Paul told George, he says, maybe if you two would just hold hands <laughs> and pray over dinner, maybe you would find some peace. We've just struggled. We've, we are both self-willed, we, intense. Um, our idea is, I mean, we're, we're very much alike in many ways and we just keep butting heads. So we, we work constantly at our relationship, but not like constantly, but I mean, we're always trying to, you know, we're, we're just, we just, we dearly love each other. We just butt heads, you know. And so Paul says, maybe you guys would just hold hands and pray. So we always end our prayer by saying, God, thank you for what you have given us, what you have taken away from us, and what you have left us. And I want you to know that after my son died, it was really hard for me to say that prayer. Because um, it was just really hard. And yet I never quit because what I meant, what, what really it was is that God did not take our son away from us. He received our son. And, um, but I, I had a hard time saying that. And um, now I say it because I realize, you know, that what God has taken away from me are my character defects and my fears and my anxieties. And he's replaced that with peace and serenity and an open heart and an ability to love beyond anything that I ever thought was possible. But anyhow, Joe's little poem, um, it's a Thomas Merton prayer. It's not conference approved. It says, I have no idea where I am going. I do not have sight of the seashore ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe this. I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. I hope that that desire is in everything I do. I hope I never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me to the, to the sandy shores, though I may know nothing of it at the time. Therefore, I will trust you always, for I may seem to be drifting and lost as a ship without a rudder. But in the moment of important decision, I will not be afraid to take action, because I know you will never leave me to face the future alone. By my prayers, you will guide me to accept your holy will. And that was foreign to me when I began to read that prayer some 18 years ago. But today I understand that though I may seem to be lost and drifting as a ship without a rudder, in the moment of important decision, I know God won't leave me to face the future alone because he has proven himself over and over and over again. So some of the other things about my personal growth, um, it was the sponsorship, the unconditional love, women's conferences, being able to be with other women, to see what your underwear looked like, to watch how you put on your makeup, to, you know, to talk about, the, take sex inventories in darkened dormitories at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and just laugh about stuff. And, and I would never let you know that I didn't know what that meant. I would pretend like I was just above you. <laughs> And, but I was listening. I was always listening. And I started, I said, I didn't know how to be a woman. I had this vision of a woman, but how did she get that way? Of course, I understand today it's not what you put on the outside. It is what happens on the inside. But let's face it, you know, what we do on the outside makes us feel a lot better as well. And I didn't know what to do with my outsides. I was bleaching my hair orange and doing some weird things, you know, to, you know, to change how I looked. But you had some real, you were just beautiful, beautiful women. And I wanted to be just like you. So I started to do what you did. And it was kind of, it was fun. You know, you showed me how to put on eye makeup. And you showed me how to use a pencil for my lip liner. And you told me about beautiful, expensive perfumes that much to Mr. B's dismay. And uh, I even have a bottle in my to-go bag that I keep with me. And, um, you know, I just, I, I, you know, it's fun to be a woman. It's just, we have, there's, we can have little play clothes, like I have my play clothes on today, and, you know, it's just, it's fun stuff. I, I, I was asked not to wear jeans for a while. They said, you know, let's see who you really are, because jeans were just, jeans and a sweatshirt were my get-up. But what I came to realize after I got in this program, and I was not allowed to wear jeans, I think, for a year, and then I didn't wear them for a while <clears throat> to meetings. I could wear them at home, but not to meetings. 
I realized that that's just who I am. I am a denim girl. You know, I love denim. So I'm back in the jeans again. But, there, you know, I always, we can look absolutely stunning in a pair of blue jeans and a T-shirt, you know. And, and you put a little belt on and you wear a little makeup and a little foo-foo and stuff. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's, a, it's not about what's on the end, but what they were trying to tell me is I was just kind of slouchy in the beginning in those jeans and I didn't care. But now that I know who I am, jeans are like one third of, of what of who I am. I mean, it's just it's just me. Um, I had to come to believe I was a child of God. I had to forgive myself. I had to be open to hugs, and being hugged in return, especially with the women. And I've already talked about that and the encouragement. And then this wearing a belt thing in bright colors was a whole new deal. I was I, I wore brown. And there's a gal in Dallas who said we were brown wrens when we got here. Well, this month, this year and last year, brown was like a color, but, you know, I mean, it was like a style color. But, you know, if you wore it, it was because you wanted to. It's not because it represented how you feel, you know, just kind of dead inside and everything. And so I, I started to wear purple. And, and Mike, I have a lot of red now. Oh, my gosh, I have a lot of red. And, um, and I love to experiment with, with me. And I bought a jacket last week that's patchwork quilt, um, all different colors of um, velvet squares in all different patterns. That is so beyond what anything I would have worn 20 years ago. I would have looked at that and been afraid you might see me. You know, I didn't want to be that noticed. And it's not about being noticed. I put on red with this new color of hair I have, you know. Red looks dazzling. You know, bright colors look wonderful when you have lighter hair. And they look wonderful when you have dark hair. But I don't think we want to stand out. It's more about not wanting to stand out, not wanting to be noticed, not wanting people to see, you know, to take notice of us. And so I have all this. A sponsor told me I had to wear a belt. Now, I don't know how this happened, but about a year and a half ago, I was standing like this and realized my waist disappeared. And I, I get, they said, Beverly, that's what's called middle age. And I thought, well, I'll be darned. So now I just had to buy bigger belts <laughs> to fit around the middle age. And, um, <laughs> But how that happened is I wore this huge paisley brown tent dress to an outing on a Saturday night. I was, I was um, at a convention with a friend of mine, and it was right after um, Scott was diagnosed with, with the AIDS, and I had gone to Florida to check on him and be with him for a while. And a, and a friend of mine from California says, I'm going to be the al speaker at the Florida State Convention. So she said, my husband's too sick to travel, and isn't that near where your son lives? I mean, all these coincidences. And so I end up being her, I went to see my kids for a week, and then Scott took me over to the hotel, and I spent four days with my friend. And I put on this Paisley number. It was huge. I mean, it was this big, and it started at my neck. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And she... We ended up going out and we had dinner and, you know, it, they foo food a lot for the speakers and stuff and I was just tailing along behind her. When we got to the room that night, she says, ditch the dress. Don't ever wear that dress in public again. And I was so hurt. And I says, why? She said, ditch the dress. And she says, if you must wear the dress, put a belt on it. She says, I saw you get dressed this morning. She said, you have a body women would die for, and there it is, hiding under that god-awful thing. <laughs> and besides being as big as this, it had a huge ruffle of even more fabric on the bottom, and it was just a little below the knees. I mean, it was, <laughs> was bad. Anyhow, she said, I want you to wear a belt. And she said, I want you to wear a belt all the time. So I like, you know, that meant, well, you can't wear sweats because you can't wear a belt. And you know what that did was it, I didn't want to wear the belt because I didn't, I didn't want to cause any attention to myself. You know, even my, my feminine features. And so she made me wear a belt. And now, I, oh, five years ago, I bought something that you absolutely couldn't wear a belt with. And I thought, oh, I hope she doesn't see me. So I called her on the phone and I said, could I be done with that belt thing? I think I know who I am now. <laughs> 
So and I did a workshop in her area a couple of years ago, and they had a garage sale, and they went around and collected all these belts. And they come in the room with this huge box, huge box. And I mean, they must have spent 20 bucks on the wrapping paper. And they says, we'd like to present you with a little gift before you do your, your workshop as a self-esteem. So I'm thinking, gee, many Christmas, this is awesome. <laughs> I unwrap it all. And there was about 250 belts in that box. <laughs> And we all just laughed, and I put the box there, and I want you to know, what is it they say about your garbage is somebody else's treasures? I want you to know that all but about 10 of those belts disappeared by the end of the workshop. I said, please, ladies, help yourself. And they went, ooh, I'll take that one. That'll go with this. That'll go with that. And all these belts disappeared. <laughs> it was fun. Um, another thing I didn't know was that I had green eyes. I was way into my 40s before I looked in the mirror one day and realized I had green eyes. I had no clue. I had hazel written on my driver's license. And do you know why that was on my driver's license? Because my mother said I had hazel eyes. The fact of the matter is, is I have green eyes. And when, I, when, you're not, when your soul is dead and you're not looking into the windows of your soul, you have no idea what color your eyes are. And I was way, I, I came in the program at 40. I was probably 48. Uh, when I when I realized how oh, what color my eyes were, and so um, now you know, and there I am putting on mascara and eyeliner and eye, and shadow and brows, and all that stuff, and I do not look in my eyes, and so now today I know, um, in order to look in my own eyes, and to be able to look in your eyes when I'm talking to you, I have to be vulnerable. It is so easy to look on top of, alongside of. And how many people do you talk to in and out of the program that they do not look you in the eyes? And I'm here to tell you that if you're going to have a conversation with me, chances are I'm going to be looking at you right in the eyes. And that's going to make some of you really uncomfortable and your eyes are going to dart everywhere but at me. But it's one of the things that I practice and I try to do. Because first of all, I had a mind that while you were talking I was trying to think of an answer. And a lot of times I cut you off and interrupted, and I still am I'm working on that feverishly today to, to listen, to listen, to listen, to listen. So when I'm looking in your eyes and I'm saying, listen and just look, pay attention to what they're saying, I'm paying attention. And then um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is that I'm giving you the opportunity to be vulnerable back. I had to ask for help. Self-sufficient, self-will run riot, you know, me had to learn how to say, would you help me? I can't do this by myself. But my first indication that I was unwilling to ask for help was that I, every meeting I went to, somebody would say, use your tools, use your tools, use your tools, use your tools. What are your tools? Do you know what your tools are? <laughs> well, you maybe knew what tools were, but I didn't know what tools were, and I was not going to ask. <laughs> because how foolish would it be if I went up to you and I said, Tracy, what are the tools? You might laugh or say, oh, don't tell me you've been in the program a year and you don't know what the tools are. Well, I know better than that. You're not going to do that to me, but I didn't know what the tools were. So one day Vesta came to our group to do the steps, and she had a little canvas bag, and she carries it in, and it's got on there, it's applique tool bag. It says Vesta's tool bag. And I thought, whoa, thank you, God. I'm going to know what the tools are. And so Vesta puts all this stuff out on the table before she starts her her step study, a telephone, a pen, a tablet, an ODAP book, an Allen on 12 and 12, um, a telephone, a candle. Um, she had a little um, tape with some meditation music on it. Um, I don't know what all. She had this, all this stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, so where are the tools? <laughs> and then all of a sudden it goes, oh, those are the tools. And then I went, oh, my God, I've been using the tools. She had a little sign that says, call your sponsor, you know, and, and meetings, go to meetings. She had these little signs up, and I thought, oh, my God, I have been using the tools. I was using the tools. So ask for help. We will not think you're funny. We will not laugh at you. We might become amused or remember where we came from, but we won't laugh at you. We'll laugh with you. And so ask for help. Um, I realized that I had to learn how to enjoy who I was. You know, I am a free spirit. I am as wacky as the day is. I'm spontaneous. Um, I like having fun. 
and I, you know, everybody's always been keeping the lid on me, and, you know, I can drive Mr. B absolutely crazy because I don't, I keep popping out of the mold, and it just, you know, it's, he goes, I don't think that was very funny. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, and today, you know, I'm not making fun at somebody. I'm enjoying my life, and I enjoy my life. And if you don't think that you can't enjoy life, if you have a golden retriever and you are not enjoying life, then you need a lot more meetings, a lot more meetings, because um, Logan has taught me how to enjoy my life. I mean, she is everything that I read about, and when she lays down on her back, her front lip folds over her nose, and all her teeth are exposed. And if that doesn't make you laugh on the blackest day, I don't, you don't have a sense of humor. There's no hope for you. Um, I gained self-confidence. When I was asked to chair my very first meeting, I want you to know I perspired all the way down to my all the way down to my waist. I was soaked. And when I used to get up and hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer, I was so nervous my eyes would twitch and I couldn't get them open. That I, I'd squint and then the tears would run down or my voice would crack. I was so afraid. Of, uh, I was the one who didn't want to be seen in the back of a room, and I know that's hard to believe today, but the fact is, is that what you see today is a woman that God has created that has always been there and was afraid to come out. And, and, and I, learned, I learned about gaining self-confidence through walking through airports, through going to meetings with people I didn't know. When I was asked initially to do the steps in Dallas, which is a, you know, one of our big deals that we do in Dallas, to be a step speaker, um, I gained confidence to drive the interstate. I was 40-some-odd years old before I drove on my first interstate. I was frantic. When I was a young girl, we lived in California for three months while George went to a school, and I accidentally went on an on-ramp to an interstate, and I froze. I was terrified. And so here's a woman now who gets in a car. He was sick one year when we had a job a couple of years back in South Carolina. I want you to know that I drove to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, almost completely by myself. A couple of weeks ago, I did a workshop in San Angelo, and I took a girl with me that I sponsor, and she and I went off, and all I knew is that eventually I-20 was going to San Angelo. Somehow there would be a sign, and I just went. Next thing I knew, I was in front of their house. And I think to myself, who is that woman? You know, who is this woman? I was in Seattle a couple of weeks ago with my grandchildren, which is where I love to go more than anything in the world. Steve lives up in Seattle now. He was here for like 15 or 17 years in Houston. And, um, and the girls, I was had to take them to school. And one school is about 20 miles away, and the other one is just two blocks away. But we take the longest one first and then take the other one. And so they're squabbling in the back seat. And I opened up the sunroof and I said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And there was like, these little girls just <laughs> stopped arguing about whatever, you know, it's like, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And they stopped arguing and I said, look, the sky is blue, the leaves are turning gold and, and bronze. I said, look at all this beauty out there. That's all God out there. Look, girls. I said, Look, it's beautiful out there today. Let's not fight. And they're looking outside, and then, and then the younger, the older one said, "Well, happy." She calls me happy. Happy. What was that stuff you wiped off the car windows today? And I says, "Well, that was due." Oh, D O. And I said, "No, D E W." Well, that's not the way you spell do. And I said, "Yeah, D the, wi the water on the windows is do D E W." Well, what is D O? And I says, "Well, that's when you do your chores and and do your schoolwork, and and that's D O." And I says, "But then there's D U E." And I says, "That's when the bills are due, and you have to, or you're due to send something in the mail, or you're you're due in a in, in school at a certain time. That's D U E." So now we're looking at the day that the Lord had made and we're spelling do, do, and do, and, and I'm quizzing them on it. And by the time we dropped the younger one off to school, they were quiet and happy and, and, and let her out. And, and they knew the definitions between the three do's. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I said, who is that woman? <laughs> I was, and, and I thought, where did she come from? She came from you, piece by piece. Woman and man in this room gave me a piece of you, and that is what you created. Was this woman that God intended me to do and I, uh, to be and do? And I am so delighted with myself. I can't hardly believe that I was even the woman that walked in here 22 years ago. I mean, it's so different. So um, I have had to learn how to find my creative gifts, 
And my creative gifts were my knitting and my needlework and um, cross-stitch and uh, crochet and, and cruel and photography. And, and this photography is just unbelievable. You know, I didn't know that I could do this, but I am I'm just astound myself. Um, and, and I have these wonderful lenses, and I don't get paid for any of my work, but what I do is take pictures of all my nieces' little girls and, and you know, anything that comes along. I just, I have 100 rolls of film in my refrigerator at any given moment. Um, Mr. Bean didn't hear that. Um, <laughs> but did he? No. <laughs> I'll just whip out a couple of rolls of film and we just flash off. I raked leaves yesterday, and, or t day before yesterday, a huge pile of leaves in the backyard, and, my nie and I was tending one of my niece's little babies. And um, when she came to pick the baby up, um, the baby was happy, and the two-year-old was just happy, and they call me happy too now. And um, she went and took him outside, and she put that little six-month-old baby right in the pile. I mean, the leaves were this high dropped that baby right down in the leaves, and she was into leaves up here, and I said, oh my God, this is a photo opportunity. And she's eating the leaves, and she's got them stuck in her hair, and I went and got the film, and we took two rolls of film, just like that. I mean, just like that. And I says, I don't have time to get these developed. Normally, I'll even develop them, and I just give them away. And I think to myself, you know, I think, oh, I'm so gifted, and, and you know, why can't I sell this? And I think someday, when I need the money, I'll sell my work. You know, God will give me an opportunity, but for right now, he just wants me to share my blessings. And that's what I do. And that's what we're all supposed to do. We're supposed to look down inside, find what we have. That's our creative talents, whether it's because you were a banker, you could be the treasurer, no matter what it is, we are so creative. Find your creative talent and give it away because you can't keep it unless you share it. So for right now, I give all my photography away. I write thank you notes on my, on my cards and, and I get to where I'm going and somebody will say, oh my God, that picture, I didn't realize you took that picture. I had it framed. It's hanging in my kitchen. Yeah, I had it framed. It's hanging in my bathroom. So you may not think you're looking at the next Ansel Adams, but you are. <laughs> and, and my work is hanging in almost as many homes as his is, except it was all for free. <laughs> So I was taught to take the program home, particularly the, tra the, the traditions, and um, to set aside an appropriate time for my prayer and meditation to watch what I ate. I don't know about you, but I was raised, I raised myself through active alcoholism on Salem cigarettes and, and um, Baby Ruth candy bars. And di not Diet Coke, because that would be ridiculous to have a Diet Coke and a candy bar. So I thought, what the heck? Coke, candy bar, cigarettes. And then I was always wondering why I was jumpy, you know. <laughs> I was skinny, though. I mean, I don't know how that happened. I was mighty skinny when I got in here. But the fact is, is I am learning to watch my diet. And I'm not here to promote diets or anything else. I'm just, in taking care of myself, I try to watch what goes down the chute. And um, uh, I have a little problem from time to time. I know that, it, you know, if I really took a look at it, that probably um, I, I could use a 12-step program with food. I mean, it's, it's definitely controls, I, I control emotions with what I put in my mouth. I'm very aware of it today. I just opt to try to do this. I have to remember that food is fuel. It's not a comfort. You know, it's not, you know, I, 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 one day I watched myself. Stephen and his girlfriend were having a fight in the back bedroom. And all of a sudden, I reached for the Christmas candy. And I thought, oh, my God, I put that connection together, you know, about the comfort and everything. So I watch what I eat today. And, and when I get upset, I try not to, you know, just try to monitor that. I exercise regularly. And a lot of it, my exercise has to do with what we do for a living. But I take care of my own house and mow my own lawn. And I was complaining to my sponsor this summer. I says, I think I'm the only 61-year-old woman in my entire subdivision who is still mowing her own lawn. And she said, Beverly, you may be the only 61-year-old woman in your neighborhood capable of pushing the lawn mower. So she says, I want you to go in and tell God thank you for this energetic, healthy body that can go out there and mow a quarter acre of grass. And so I do that. And I think, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And I just sing my little praises to God because my body is healthy and I can mow my own yard. Um, my son used to buy me flowers. 
And when he died, one of the greatest griefs that I had was that I would never get flowers because Mr. B, I have to look for the way Mr. B tells me he loves me, which is that he keeps, he keeps everything running and fixed and he makes sure I'm safe and he does all that stuff, but he's not much on flowers and presents. And, and I, you know, I used to think that that was the measuring stick. And then when Scott died, I thought, oh, I'll never have another flower. And then I was told, you could buy your own. And see, Scott used to not buy flowers. He always picked yours and gave them to me. And um, I, so I wanted you to—I just wanted you to know that if he was in your garden, thank you very much because I appreciated all the flowers that I got from you through him. And um, anyhow, Tuesday is the day that they bring fresh flowers into Walmart in my area. I don't know what day, but in my little corner grocery store at Walmart. In fact, all of our huge supermarkets. Tuesday is the day that they deliver all the fresh flowers. I always make a point of going to the grocery store on Tuesday later in the afternoon and I buy myself a little $3.88 bouquet of flowers and put them in a vase on my kitchen table. And you know what? When they're that fresh, they last over a week a lot of times. And I always have fresh flowers. If you come to my house, you will always find some fresh flowers on my kitchen table because I am responsible for my own happiness. And flowers bring me happiness. And so I can go to the store and buy them. You do not have to give them to me in order to make me happy. Um, the other thing I love to do is when my boys were little, I used to pay them a quarter to rub my feet. Now I find out that on every, cor on every corner there are nail salons. And if you pay them $20, they will rub your feet for a whole hour. And um, I was, you know, I just love to do that. And I was, in, I was in Oregon at the end of September and I had on shoes that didn't have toes. Now I know right now... Most of those women thought I was crazy because they, they dress like lumberjacks up there, flannel and everything, clothes everywhere. And here I am, I've got my open-toed red shoes on, and I'm sitting in the john. And I don't know, you would see, you must be careful because people are watching you everywhere. We are always, we could always be the best example of this program anybody's going to read. And I didn't know that while I was sitting on the pot, the lady in the stall next to me that was sitting on the pot next to me was looking at me. She was looking at my feet. And when I got out, I washed my hands and went out into the, into the big waiting area out there, and I got visiting with some people that I knew. And all of a sudden, this little woman, she was very small and very thin, she came up and she went, Oh, my God, you're the lady with the feet. <laughs> she says, I have never seen such beautiful feet in all my life. And I thought, there is nothing beautiful about my feet. But I had a pedicure, and I had bright red polish on there, and it was freshly done, you know. And she had never seen a woman with a pedicure. And I said, you know what, there's nail salons everywhere. And I says, for a very small amount of money, you can have beautiful feet too. She says, I didn't know that. And so you beware, ladies, you just never can tell. But that was the most incredible thing, you know, because I looked down, and I take this for granted and there's some woman in Oregon who had never seen a woman with a pedicure. And see, I was the little woman who walked into the dormitory at my first woman to woman, and I had never seen women with eyeshadow and perfume and, and lace underwear and pretty pajamas. See, we never know how the newcomer is going to look at us or somebody who's hurting is going to see us or what we're going to say that's going to take somebody into a whole new experience of recovery. So watch your feet. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> let's see, I found out that I liked music. And do you know what? I also found out about a month ago that Dish has music. I thought Dish only had CNN because that's, I, I don't know how I knew that. I guess that's because that's Mr. B's button. But I found out all the way, way far away from home, I walked into some lady's house and had coffee and the music was playing. It was absolutely glorious. And I said, that is really beautiful music. And she says, oh, it's just on my satellite. And here she had music coming out of her television. Well, I want you to know he's lost his clicker. <laughs> I have control of the clicker. <laughs> And there's country music and new age music and classical music and instrumental and adult. I mean, you can have any kind of music you like. If you don't know what kind of music you like, turn it on and just keep pressing the buttons. They do, you know. <laughs> just keep pressing the buttons until you find what you like. And I was introduced to the things that I liked. Somebody took me many years ago to, a, um, to the uh, Mort Meyerson music, and I got to hear a symphony. And I loved it. 
And I thought classical music, that was for old people. And I found out I loved classical music. And then I was introduced to Kitaro and, and, and just, I mean, I found out, somebody looked through my CDs and they go, it would be hard to identify your choice of music by looking through your CDs, because I like everything, you know, but I didn't know that. I mean, I just thought I liked Bill Haley and the Comets and the Beach Boys. That was my, that was the extent of what I knew. And here come to find out, I love, I love music. I love all kinds of music. Um, let's see. The other thing I'm going to tell you is that I love myself so much today, I go for a well woman checkup every single July. That's my birthday. My birthday's in July, and I give myself a present of going for my mammogram and my well woman checkup. And, um, you know, that was something I'd go four or five years without, you know, going to the doctor because, first of all, it was, ex you know, it was very unpleasant. And it, and it cost, you know, a copay. And I didn't think I was worth it. But I'm here to tell you that my birthday comes along, and in May I make my appointment for, Jan for July so I can have my well woman checkup and my mammogram. And, um, and, and I go to the dentist and get my teeth cleaned, and I wash my face every night before I go to bed. And I put on a little bit of cream, nothing fancy, just a little bit of cream, and, um, and keep my, you know, these are the things, this is the way I tell myself that I love me, is to take care of myself. You know, this is the only, this is the only outfit I'm going to get, you know, and, and if I don't take care of it, and see, I have this idea that I'm, I am the, one of the, we are entering into this new generation of women. This is the Beverly Burnett theory on this. My grandmother and my mother died before their 60th birthday. And I think that we, and particularly those of us who are in recovery, have the great opportunity to not only living into our 80s and 90s, but having useful, healthy, happy lives. And the only way that we can assure that is to take care of some of the basic, the basic needs that our bodies have. Because, I mean, I've lived the first 20 years I was at home. The second 20 years I read, raised my children. The third 20 years I've worked with Mr. B. And I've got another 20 years. I just don't know what I'm going to be doing, but I am so excited about it. I just know God has another 20-year plan for me. And I can't wait to find out what it is. You know, Georgia O'Keeffe was an old lady when she started her career. And, and, um, and you know, I don't know what, I don't know what. I have in store, but what I know is if I take some simple steps towards my own personal recovery, that maybe I'll have a crack at another 20 years of happy life. And you know, I haven't had enough yet. 22 years out of 61 is not enough happy life. And even the first beginning of it, till you get a hang of this program, it's not enough. I mean, it's only really been in the last seven years that I've had this life that's peaceful inside of me, and I like who I am, and I, I recognize all of my abilities. I want more. I want more. I don't want to quit now. I don't want to die like my mom when she was 58 or my grandmother when she was in her, I think, 55 or 56. You know, I want to have this chance. God's given me this opportunity for spiritual health, and I, and I can help along by having some physical health along with that. So that's about me. Does anybody need to go to the potty? Does anybody need a little teeny-weeny little break? Huh? How about a five-minute stretch break? Okay. It's 10 minutes to, we will stretch until 5 minutes to. Anyhow, I'm going to wrap up the rest of my relationships. Some of the things um, that I have done for my self-esteem was to be able to accept compliments. And, you know, that is really hard. Most of us will, if, uh, for instance, I was wearing... I went to the meeting Tuesday. I'm chairing the meeting. I've got this big fuzzy sweater. It's got what you call eyelash stuff on it. And somebody came up to me and said, that is the cutest sweater I have ever seen. And I said, well, thank you. It really is cute. And I said, I got to go to this wholesale place. And I got it for $9. She says, I don't care. I just thought it was cute. And I thought, Winnie Eddy tells the most wonderful story. Somebody came and asked her what time it was. And by the time she finished telling him how she got the watch and how it was built and where it was manufactured, she turned around and the guy had disappeared. And, <laughs> and I always loved that story about Winnie. But anyhow, just say thank you. You know, it's just say thank you, and, um, <clears throat> so, and don't question their intelligence. Be yourself. Let your guard down. Allow others to see who you are, um, and you may be surprised at how much they like you. 
Um, be inquisitive. Ask questions when you don't understand something. The more you know, the more comfortable you'll be around other people. Make yourself heard. Don't be afraid to voice your opinions. There's half of us in this room who were afraid to voice our opinions and half of us in this room who voiced our opinions about everything. Both of us got in trouble and we're all in the same room. So don't be afraid to voice your opinions. People will respect you more when they know um, what you stand for. Um, know your strengths. Give yourself credit for a job well done. Um, I always would say, oh, that was nothing. Oh, I do that all the time. You know, and that's how I would handle that. You know, and, and you know, now I give myself credit. I did a great job. You know, I did a good job with that. Um, so I, I try to, I, I, you know what, I am, I am my best cheerleader. And I am always telling... Sometimes when I'm alone and I'm afraid in an airport or I'm alone or I'm afraid in the highway and I'm not sure if I've taken the right turn because the dyslexia turns me around a lot um, and I, am, I really am troubled with that and, I, and, and if I find myself not sure where I am, I go, it's okay, it's okay, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, it's going to be okay and I talk to myself very kindly the way you would to a frightened child and I assure myself that I'm okay that it's okay if I'm on the wrong street, you can go in and out. I talk to myself like that all the time, and I calm myself down. And you know what? When I get done, I go, see, girl, you did it. You did it. You're okay. But all the time I'm in my pockets with my people in my pocket because I have all my little people in my pocket that I hang on to their strength, and I, and I go ahead and I forge through. I have done things that you wouldn't even believe. Being afraid of heights, not being able to walk upstairs or cross over the crack of an elevator or go upstairs without backs or glass elevators. I mean, I couldn't go to the top of the Empire State Building. I stood on the street while my husband and my two little boys went up there because I was afraid to go over the crack in the elevator. And then I was even more terrified to be on the top. I want you to know in February when I was in Seattle, God makes it possible for me to go to Seattle every six to eight weeks. And I don't usually have to pay the tab. It's been an amazing thing for me. But when I was there in February, I took my two little granddaughters to the Space Needle. And, you know, that's, not, that, that's only the end result. When I was 50 years old, the culmination of my fear, my fear of heights happened in a hot air balloon in Crested Butte, Colorado. And there I was, you know, on a flight in a hot air balloon. So if we're willing, God will take us by the hand and walk us through everything. But just because I've conquered some major fears with God's help and I'm, you know, and I feel, just feel strong, it doesn't mean that day to day I don't get afraid. You know, I do get afraid. And so I have to talk myself through it, just like if I was a little afraid little child. See, it's okay, Beverly, I know you're afraid, but you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And I do it. Keep an open mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to a room full of people who have the ability to close our minds to absolutely everything, but tr be adventurous and try new things. Um, don't have, you don't have to be an expert at something to take part. Besides that, the fun is just getting there. Um, allow yourself to fail. If you take some of the pressure off to be perfect, um, you will be less stressed, more production, and more likely to succeed. And what I found out, I took one photography class, not that I wanted anybody to tell me how to take pictures, but I didn't know the mechanics of the camera. And, there's, and, and in order to create some things, I had to know about the light and the aperture, how fast the... the, the. Anyhow, I went there, and, um, and the man told me I was gifted right off the bat. He said, this lady has the gift. He picked up my pictures the first week. But he also understood that I could not get the connection between the light and the shutter speed. And he worked on it week after week, and he was so patient. He drew the circles, and he drew the little triangles, and the light, and the big, and the small. And I kept looking at it, and one night I sat there, and it went in. And I went, oh, my God. He said, she got it. <laughs> and I understand about depth of field and, the, and all that stuff now. But you know what? I wasn't embarrassed because I didn't get it. I mean, I learn different than most people. I have to be patient with myself. I don't get it right away. On the other hand, I'm like Rain Man. I, under, I know more numbers than you could ever even imagine. Um, and and I, it just happens. So um, I have, 
Anyhow, keep an open mind. Allow yourself to fail. Oh, what he says is, take when you take a roll of pictures, throw away everything that's not good. It means if you throw away 24 pictures, it's okay. So I'm thinking waste. He says, why keep the ones that are bad shots? And he says, bad shots don't mean you're a bad photographer. Bad shots happen all the time. He said, you throw them away. You only keep the good one. He says, if you're lucky, you'll get one good picture in a roll. Throw the other ones away. And wow, it didn't mean I had failed. This is a professional man saying, throw them away. And it cuts back on a lot of debris and hanging on to all this crap. Throw them away. So I did. Um, so um, let's see. Avoid making comparisons because you're always going to come up short. This, anytime that I have ever compared myself to somebody else, I have always taken the lesser role. And so I have com completely, I tried not to judge myself by somebody else. Um, I, I wrote here, when you judge other people based solely on the public image, you are overlooking the fact that in private, they too may experience anxiety, self-doubt, anger, and have clay feet. These are some of the things that I fear. I fear, um, fear of the grief that I will feel. Um, my dog's 11, and you know she has definite signs of aging, and I know the feeling of grief, and I am terrified to feel that pain again, and yet I know I'm going to have to do it. But somebody clarified that by saying, the deeper the pain, the deeper the love. And what I know is that when it comes time for me to grieve this old dog, that the depth of that grief is going to mean how dearly I loved her. And what I know without a shadow of a doubt is that shortly afterwards, God will find me another brand new best friend. I don't have any fear about that. It will be another golden retriever. I tell you that much, I tell you. Yesterday we went to that burrito joint and there was this guy in a brand new Lexus, four door, leather seats, top of the line. He was a yuppie type. And he's got a baby golden retriever in the front seat of the car. He was my kind of guy. He had all four windows open and they were waiting for somebody. And the dog is just walking from the back seat to the front seat. And I, I walked up to the car and I said to the dog, somebody around here must love you very, very much. And, and the guy says to me, we do. <laughs> and there was Penny, and she was 11 months old, and they adored her, you know. And I don't know who they were waiting for, but, you know, I, after Penny just drooled and licked all over my hand, I, as I was halfway through my burrito, I thought, hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But on many, many occasions when I get off at the airport, I always kiss Logan on the lips and then forget and have to kiss George. And I said to him, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Somebody said to me, do you realize you kissed the dog before you kissed your husband? And I said, oh, he understands. <laughs> but you know what? It is just absolutely as therapeutic as it can get to take this great big face and just give a dog a kiss on the lips. And in one of my little things about dogs here, it says, kiss him on the lips. It says, kiss your dog all the time. Oh, it doesn't say on the lips. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. B. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, a fear, the fear of the height, fear of facing my difficulties, and fear that the difficulty that you're facing today is going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. This too shall pass. My friend in Dallas says, always says, we always think this too shall last, this too shall pass. <laughs> and um, the fear that I will not find my passion in life. I think I'm in the middle of a passion now, but I want a new one. I mean, I have a passion about being able to do these workshops. I am so grateful when God calls me on the phone in the, in the voice of whoever calls and says, would you like to do a workshop? I mean, it's my passion. I love doing this. And I love the photography, and I love my grandchildren, you know, my little granddaughters. I have passion for life today. But I don't think it's passion for any particular one thing. I just have a passion for life today. I love living. And so um, <clears throat> fear that God will forget 
uh, will forget to use me. And you know what? He is so happy that he has another volunteer. He wants to use all of us. And, uh, and as long as we're following his path in some little tiny way, he wants us to be of maximum service to him and to our fellow man. And so as long as I'm willing, he's going to give me plenty of work to do. Plenty of work to do. I had a lot of fear of angry people. <clears throat> I just kept drawing them into my life, trying to reproduce my childhood. And all of a sudden, one of my many, many sponsors said to me, Beverly, it's okay to have, to have warm, loving, nurturing women in your life. And that was a real eye-opener because I kept wanting my relationships with other women to be angry women. And, and then I would have to grovel and beg for your forgiveness and everything. And she says, why don't you just accept the fact that there's a lot of loving women out there who are just desperate to be your friend. And so I let it go. I let go of a lot of my angry relationships. I was uh, competitive. <clears throat> I had fear of not having my place or that someone would get mine. And so it's not... It's not like sports-minded competitiveness because I've never been really an athlete. I've been a swimmer and I roller skated and I could do the jungle gym bars and you know I mean I was very very I, gymnastic or anything, but not competitive in that nature. <clears throat> but I am competitive with my sisters in this fellowship, and and you know it's going now. I have to talk myself through that. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Because sometimes I think you're going to get my share. And uh, we sometimes think that, you know, we're not going to get our share of attention in a meeting. We're not going to get our share of love. We're not going to get our share of responsibility. We're not going to get our share of friendships. And the fact is that we're going to get our share. And uh, so I always have that, that competitive anxiety. Not anymore, but it was a real problem for me. I, I, was, I had a fear of trusting God, thinking that um, I am in control and that I do not matter, you know, and so I was afraid to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, and a lot of people emphasize that by saying, you know, I was afraid he would send me to China and sell Bibles on street corners. Well, do you know what? The people who do that in Seattle are happy, joyous, and free, and I thought if God sends me to Seattle or to China with a stack of Bibles and I, and I preach on a corner, they're in the sunshine. They're having a great time. Most people don't pay attention to them, but in Seattle, the streets are filled with musicians and and street vendors and people who are preaching the Bible and this, every religion you could imagine. They're all out on the streets. It's a, downtown Seattle is an active, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be. I love being down there. And so um, if that's the worst thing that could happen to me, I hope God sends me to Seattle. I don't care. Um, <clears throat> fear of flexibility, um, losing control, fear of finances, and I want to talk a little bit about, about the money thing quickly. Fear of death, long-term illness, being locked in a body that doesn't work. Um, fear of my obsessions, and oh, I have had some Lulus. Um, fear of getting my way and fear of not getting my way. You know, it's, it's, it's always this, um, I, I'm always, you know, balancing that. Fear of looking foolish, that one is down on the bottom of my list, but the fact of the matter is fear of looking foolish should be at the top of my list because I have always feared that you were going to laugh at me or ridicule me. And that goes way back to my childhood, way back. And so, you know, as a part of my recovery, it doesn't matter. If I look foolish, most of the time I'm having fun, and if that's your opinion of me. It's not my opinion of me, it's your opinion of me. And it doesn't matter. You know, as long as I haven't hurt you, it doesn't matter what I do. I can make amends for it. I can ask your forgiveness if it was terribly inappropriate. If I was having fun and you think I, and you think I was inappropriate, get over it. Um, <clears throat> fear of success and not knowing how to handle it and fear of my anger and rage and being out of control. A year and a half ago, I have not had a burst of anger. I have white hot rage. I was, I was a woman who took a diapered baby and a wooden spoon, and on a day when I was irritable and, and angry at alcoholism, I picked up a diapered baby and a wooden spoon, and I almost beat that child to death. And the voice of God that day yelled at me, if you don't, if you put, if you don't put that baby down, you will kill him. And I promise you I heard it. And I put it down, and I stepped back appalled, and I'm looking at myself, and I think, how could you do that? How could you do that? And I made a promise never to do that again, but I would pinch them and pull their hair and do obnoxious other things. But to my knowledge, I never hit them in that kind of rage again. But that rage continued. My brother is currently serving his eighth prison sentence in the last 10 years. He's in the Utah State Prison right now. 
he was in line going to a computer class. They finally have put him into a rehab prison. Um, he's not a thief or a rapist. or He is an alcoholic who violates probation by driving drunk. He is an alcoholic. That's what my brother is. And he gets back in there over and over because the state of Utah does not look kindly on alcoholics. And um, so he's walking to a computer class, which he dearly loves. I have been writing to him every single Wednesday for the past two and a half, almost three years. Actually, Thanksgiving, it'll be three years, through two prison sentences. Um, and I write to him, that's my amend to my brother. We're nine years difference in age. And for um, a period from 1990 until 19... 98, I had no relationship with my brother at all because his alcoholism was progressed and, and you just couldn't, I couldn't talk to a, a, a drunk. I mean, th it was, you know what it's like, and he was a, his alcoholism had progressed. So when I made the decision um, to write to him because he was sober in prison, we have this wonderful relationship going and it's my amend to my brother. So I have this huge box full of letters. They're wonderful letters, and we write back and forth. He sends me flowers from prison. Now, it's an adrenaline rush to go to the warden's quarters and steal a flower out of the garden, but he presses the flower, and he pastes it on my letter, and I take those flowers, and I put them under the glass on my desk, and I have, he, and every time I go, dear precious brother, thank you so much for the flowers, because he understood I told him about the flowers in Scott and how I buy my own flowers. And ever since I sent him that letter, I get a pressed flower from the Utah State Prison. And he gets this adrenaline rush to go collect this flower. See? <laughs> so, back to the original story. He's walking to his computer class about a little over a month ago, and some guy, two guys are talking in front of him, and the one guy says, what are you in here for? And the guy says something, and the other guy says, well, what are you in here for? And he says, I'm in here because I raped and molested a 14-year-old girl. And my brother grabbed the guy by the shirt collar and he rearranged the man's face. That rage came up in him just like that. And before he even had a moment to think about it, and I don't know where it came from, could be part of our childhood, um, he, without even thinking, just, I mean, he, he messed this guy up pretty bad. Now the guy gets to go off happy, joyous, and free, and my brother ends up in 30 days lockdown, lost his television, lost his status, lost his computer class, lost all of his, his college classes or whatever he was going to, lost his personal belongings, everything. And he has to go sit in solitary confinement, uh, lockdown for 30 days. He wrote to me from lockdown, and he said to me, I'm sorry, I can't send a flower, and he drew one on the corner. And he doesn't know where that rage comes from. He doesn't know. And, you know, I wrote him back and I thought, I'm going to share my rage with him. And I told him, I says, Bill, I know that feeling. I know that white hot rage that comes from nowhere. And I says, believe it or not, you know, with this program, and I try not to talk about the program very much. You know, I don't want to force it down his throat. But I says, the program has helped me with the rage. But a year and a half ago, my husband and I are working in Longview, and I go to take Logan out. The Saturday night speaker started. I go to take Logan out, go out the back door very discreetly, and Logan goes out, and she never makes any noise at a convention. She knows the drill. And when I walked out the back door, there were about five kids jumping off the roof of the building onto our utility trailer, and I went just nuts. Nuts. I mean, I went from happy, joyous, and free, taking my dog out to potty, having a wonderful day, to insane in a half a second. Now, I not only got after those kids, I chased those kids down through the parking lot. And they're so afraid of me. I mean, this mad woman comes out of there. I mean, chased them through the parking lot and then made them go in the building and get their parents because oh, I wanted their phone numbers. And I called my sponsor the next day and I says, where does that come from? What happens to me? We walked through it. She said, Beverly, you were raised in a family where things were covered with plastic. You were taught to respect your elders. And there you walk out the back door and they're jumping on your property. She says, probably it triggered that. And I says, but I don't want anything left in my past to trigger that kind of rage. Well, for the next two weeks, I had two more episodes, one at the grocery store and one, that was before I knew Bonnie, one at the grocery <laughs> store and one um, at, at the cleaners. They had the audacity to launder my black jeans instead of dry clean them. Do you know what happens to your black jeans when they launder them instead of dry clean them? And then she stood there and looked me right in the eye and said they didn't do it. 
You could smell the soap. And you know, I wasn't born yesterday. I was so upset. And so I thought, you know what? It's only a pair of jeans. You know, it's only a pair of jeans. This is not worth your serenity. But where does this come from? How does this happen? What triggers that? I haven't had another episode of that kind of rage for a year and a half. Maybe it won't come back this time, but maybe it will. I don't know what other healing is left inside of me. There, there's more. I'm sure of it. So those are those things. Um, I sat down one day when my life wasn't going very well, and I wrote my own personal rules for living. A person's behavior is a circumstance of my life. It is not my life. It is my responsibility to only do what is mine to do. Number two, it is my responsibility to see the beauty of each day. Number three, no one has the power to ruin my day unless I allow it. Number four, I am no longer a martyr. I do not need to be negative. Number five, I choose to stay happy. I choose to stay where I am and I will be happy. Number six, it is, my responsi- it is not my responsibility to create a social life for another individual or feel guilty for having my own. Seven, it is not my responsibility to do for another person what they are capable of doing for themselves. Number eight, it is best for me to keep much of my personal life to myself, focus on the good and share with God. Well, so much for that. <laughs> I really am an open book. I'll tell you about almost about 99.9% of my life. But, but sometimes there are some things that it's not okay, you know, that you just don't talk about in meetings and such. Number nine, try, do not try to be perfect. Do your very best and remember that you are only human. Number 10, today I promise to change my own actions and my attitudes. Number 11, no individual is the source of my joy or my pain. And number 12, my relationship with God and myself are all that matter. If they are in order, my life will be as as well. Stop thinking about the difficulties in my life and think of the good and God. Um, I've told you a lot about my friendships and what I really think about my friendships. And I want to share with you just one thought that you might want to consider. Some of us think that all friendships need to be really close, really intimate, really gut-level And do you know what I was told a long time ago? If we are lucky in a lifetime, if we are lucky, we may have three really close friends. That's the people that you unzip the zipper and they get to come right into your soul, that they know the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's no judgment. There's no anything. You guys, you share back and forth. It's open. She cries when you cry. You laugh when she laughs. and, And you do all that stuff. I have had one friend like that in my entire life, and her name is Mary Ann, and I haven't seen her for a long time. But if I saw her today, it would be like not one minute ever passed between us. I know that. She lives in the East Coast, and I live here, and I hear from her, you know, during the Christmas holidays usually. And um, But when my son died, I had not heard from her for a long time, and she sat and wrote me a four-page letter about all the things she remembered about Scott when he was a little boy and played in her backyard. She gave me a gift. You know, that's what a friend does for you. You know, that's what your very best friend does for you. Most of us have friends where you say, let's go out for dinner, and and you have dinner, and you go to a meeting, and you laugh, and they know a lot of details about your life, but not the intimate ones. And if you don't see each other for a while, that's okay. You have other friends, and you do these kinds of things, but it's never going to be at that level that my friend Mary Ann and I went. We know all of you in this room have one friend at least that's like that. And then we have thousands of acquaintances. People where we might know their first name, perhaps their last name. You say, hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? God, it's good to see you. Yeah, well, we'll have to have lunch sometime. And you're gone. And you know what? Those, are, those people pass through your life and they give you little messages and they're just out there. Where I get caught up is that I have to remember that not everybody is going to be like my Mary Ann, you know. And um, one day I said to my sponsor, you know, I don't have any really close friends. And she says, Beverly, you don't have time for them right now. She says, how could you nurture that kind of a friendship right now? And, but I have a couple of friends in Dallas that no matter what, if I say I need you, they're there. You know, and that's all I need. And for right now, I'm, you know, I'm everywhere. I'm, I've got kids in Seattle and, you know, this and going on here and working with him. I have this wonderful life. I don't have the time. She says, when the time comes, God will present you with another 
dear best friend. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that with, with great um, hope. Um, friendships should be mutually rewarding. If you're the only one calling, if you're the only one buying dinner, if you're the only one saying, let's go to the movie, you know, if, if you're the only one sharing you and you don't hear anything coming back, and there are people that are really tricky about that. You can sit and have lunch for them, and all of a sudden you realize that they've asked you all these questions, and, and you've given them answers, and they have shared nothing about themselves. I do not have lunch with those kind of people anymore. I, when I first realized, when I began to realize what was going on, I thought, you know what, my time is too precious. I don't need this kind of a friendship because it was not mutually rewarding. So, and then you can ask yourself, do you want to be in the friendship? Do you want to be in the sponsorship relationship? If, if it's not mutually rewarding, it's okay to terminate these relationships. Not in an ugly way, but it's okay. Um, and I didn't know that. I thought I had to hang in there until I was 105. Um, so anyhow, that's my little thing about that. Um, most friendships are shallow and, um, you know, news, gossip, no personal disclosure or investment um, and moves attention away from the speaker. Uh, so anyhow, those, that's that. Um, my relationship with money, um, my mom and dad were depression children. And they stood in bread lines literally and got potatoes and bread and whatever small pittances of things that you needed to survive. They lived in Chicago, right in the city of Chicago. And so when I um, was a child, God, uh, money was a god. And um, my mother sent me to work when I was 12 years old. She says, it's time for you to, keep, to earn your own keep. She says, I'll get your teeth fixed and send you to the doctor, but everything else is up to you. So from the time I was 12 years old, um, I, was, I was working. I worked in a movie theater. I worked for a, a guy who took wedding photographs. I dried his pictures after school. Um, and I always had my own little bit of money. But I'll tell you what, the money that you can earn when you're 12 and 13 years old is not, you're not going to have a lot. I'm, I'm here to tell you, you don't get a lot. But um, that's how that was. So money was this God. And I was always saving. And I have Sunday clothes. I, before I would start to wear the clothes they would buy, they would be out of style because, you know, they were always say, don't ruin that, save it for Sunday, you know, that's your best, and wear your junk. Well, I'm, you know, I'm 55 years old in this program, and I'm still saving my stuff for Sunday because I'm afraid, you know, to, to use it up. And I feel that same way about the money in, a, in the checking account and the savings account is we can't use it because we have to save it for Sunday. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you Sunday's here. <laughs> and uh, now, <clears throat> here's what happened. We got robbed at an AA convention about three years ago in Dallas, Texas, of a great deal of money. Maybe not to some of you, but to us it was a huge amount of money. I want you to know that it was very humbling to have to stand on Sunday morning and give everybody their product and not have a nickel to show for it. And then I realized that I was lucky I didn't get killed be over that kind of money because where we were working in that area of Dallas, people have been killed for a dollar. And all that they did was distract me and get me down to one end of the table and the other guy came in and they had, we'd been watched on surveillance cameras by the catering staff. That's the only way that they could have known that we didn't keep the money in the, in the cash box. It was in another location. And I was very grateful that I didn't get hurt. I could have died for that money. If I would have resisted them in any way, shape, or form, I could have died over that money. Now, I want you to know that throughout the years, from the time George lost his job, it was a matter of surrendering this financial thing, surrendering, surrendering, surrendering. And it was a long, long process. There were, at some point in time in there, I decided I'm not a member of, a, of any kind of formal religion anymore, and I haven't been since I walked out of that Monsignor's office. <clears throat> but I also came to, to a place where I understood that I needed to tithe. You can't keep it unless you give it away. And I didn't know how to do that. You know, I didn't know if you walk in the Catholic Church and throw a dollar in the back, you know, throw a couple of bucks in, the, in an envelope somewhere. I didn't know how to do that. Well, I'm ready. God sends a messenger. I'm sitting there. I'm listening to a Sunday morning speaker at a convention, and he says, I don't belong to any formal religion, but I, found, I came to a place in my recovery where I knew I had to tithe. And he said, so I picked a couple of organizations that were important to me, and I send money and contributions on a regular basis to those organizations. So I started to send money to the Humane Society and the SPCA, and we made Scott a quilt. And um, 
and it, you know, one of the AIDS quilts, and it costs money for them to keep those quilts up. And so I send money off to the AIDS Foundation to Friends of the Quilt and for the maintenance and care of my son's quilt. And I do those things. And then shortly after we got robbed, Sarah had the opportunity. Um, she, Doreen saw an 800 number on the television set, and she called the number. They sent her a form. And as a result of it, she got picked out of a lottery for one of those scholarships for indigent children. And it was, a, it was just a, um, a lottery. Out of 40,000 kids, I don't know how many they picked, but it wasn't very many because it was nationwide. People like Forbes and Walmart and Microsoft and I don't know who all. Um, Ross Perot threw large sums of money in a hat to give kids who would ordinarily not have a real wonderful opportunity at education threw money in a hat and by a lottery system nationwide they gave X number of kids an opportunity to have a private education and my Sarah got one of those education opportunities. And, but the deal is, is that the scholarship fund didn't completely pay for it and the school gave her a scholarship but there was still a balance left and I have an opportunity to tithe for Sarah. You know, and I see to her clothes, and I see to her um, needs, and we, we pay that part of the education, and it was a real healing thing for me, you know, to continue to give money away. I tip the maids now when I go in a hotel. I don't tip them once. I, tip, I, leave, I leave them money every single time, you know, Friday, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, I leave them money. I tip the cab drivers. I tip people, you know, I always used to look in my little chart and make sure if it was 90 cents that I left exactly 90 cents, and then I bickered about that. You know, now I'm willing to leave an abundance on a table, you know, in excess of what it is. Sometimes it's a little struggle because the old ideas come back. But the fact is, is that I am generous with what I have, um, and I just have to believe. And so it was a long process. You know, it's still in the process, um, 60 years of process to get over what I was taught as a child. And that, you know, one day when I was in the midst of the fear, many, many years ago, we were in Florida doing a job, and when we got there, the woman changed the rules. And, um, and, it, and it upset us because we, you know, I, and I looked at her and I said, you know, if we can't put this stuff out, we have no other means of being able to earn our keep. And I says, we're here being self-supporting through our own contributions. And she says, well, I, we can't do this. And I says, I wrote you a letter. You understood and approved exactly what our deal was. And she says, well, I didn't understand exactly, and she's trying to manipulate this. And I says, I'll tell you what, you are free to do this any way you want, but if we can't put out our display, I said, we're going to go home. And she said well, she's going to have a group conscience. <laughs> and she says, okay, you can stay. And I says, well, what was that all about? And she says, well, I had a group conscience when one or more are gathered. She says, when two or more are gathered, she says, I just conversed with God, and you can stay. Well, I, we, we did our thing like we always did. And the next morning, I was out, the morning, I, we got there on Thursday. So Friday morning, the convention's going to start, and we're all set up, ready to go. And I go for a 6 o'clock in the morning walk along the, it, the ocean. It was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I'm walking, and I'm squinting, and I'm looking, and I see something kind of floating on top of the water. And all of a sudden, I look, and it's a brand-new $1 bill. I have it in my journal. I am not kidding you. Brand-new $1 bill come floating in on the surf. Well, I had heard from a speaker that the money comes from everywhere, and I just couldn't help but laugh. Here this money comes, a dollar bill, and I thought, okay, God, I get it. And um, my son, I told my son about it, and he says, Mom, they probably had a drug bust out there. <laughs> um, you would know. <laughs> So I've had all kinds of distorted ideas about finances, and the fact is money is a means of barter. Money is not a god, and that's as simple as it gets. If I give you this, I receive this. If I give Walmart $35, I get $35 worth of gro groceries. You know, if I give my beautician $35, she cuts my hair. If I give the guy at the beauty store $20, he does my toes. It's barter. It's, that's all that it is. We put such high priorities on it. It's just, and I, I'm not talking as an expert. I'm talking from a woman who has gone from complete total fear, who wouldn't, I got stuck, I used to deliver no-nonsense pantyhose out of a truck, in, in, and I had kind of a large territory. In spite of the fact that I couldn't go on highways, I went on all back roads. But one night I had to deliver a rack on Long Island, and I had to take one of the, like the George Washington Bridge or the Tappan Zee Bridge back home, and I didn't have enough money in my wallet after dark to pay the 
fee to get over the bridge. And that's tragic. I look back over that. You know, it has always controlled me. So anyhow, <clears throat> um, things have happened that I never expected. George and I have ended up, out of, you know, through an amazing thing, been able to pay off our house. And, you know, we live in this house. And, and you know, who would have ever thought when we signed a 30-year note on that thing, I figured we'd be living in it 30 years and be scrambling the whole time. And we paid that note off about five years ago. And I was just like, whoa, how did this happen, you know? Um, so anyhow, um, I've had some, I've had a lot of growth in that area. My work, I used to have a hard time with work. Um, I caused problems with co-workers, I gossiped, I did not cooperate with my supervisor, I did not like to be told what to do, I did not take criticism well, I justified or became angry, and I was always late for work, and I had an excuse. My assets in employment were, I did as much work as three employees, I was pleasant to my customers, I was nice to be around most of the time, and I was very good at what I did, I was an asset to the bank. Um, in 1986, I had to go to work for Mr. B. It started out, the B&B &B originally was my son and him, but when, when my son had a full-time real job down here in Houston, he couldn't come home every weekend and help us out, so I was... Um, I don't know if I was drafted or enlisted or recruited or dragged or what I was, but I went unwillingly into the business. I thought to myself, this is really beneath me. And, you know, I, I, have, I had such an attitude about a lot of things. And so I'm now working for my husband. I caused problems with my husband. I would not cooperate with him and his ideas. I did not like him to tell me what to do. I made everything as difficult as I possibly could, and we were always fighting in front of you. And people would come with a cup of coffee and say, Beverly, why don't you come with me and have a cup of coffee and let him just quiet down. Or they'd say to him, why don't you why don't you um, come with me and I'll help you put that wire down and let her leave her alone for five minutes. And, and I mean, we did this over and over. I mean, a lot of you saw us work in the early days. It was not a pretty sight. Okay, so now my sponsor shows up at Crested Butte one year and I said, I have been, I have had enough of this. I am so embarrassed. We're fighting all the time in front of the people we go to meetings with. I said, this is terrible. I need you to tell me what to do. So we ride up the ski lift and I have my notebook and my pen and I'm ready to take notes. And she says, oh, it's real easy. Treat him like the boss. I wanted to lift up the thing on the ski lift and just push her out into those lovely birch trees and hope that the deer carried her skeletal remains away. She says I was supposed to cooperate with him 100% all the time. I was to respect his wishes, even if I didn't agree with him. And you know what? The end result was I went to work that night and I thought, well, what could it hurt? So I started. And, and immediately, everything changed. Not all the time. I'm not going to say that we both don't get into a little controversy from now on. But when I let him be the boss, and I did it exactly, she says, it's his company, Beverly. You're only his employee. Well, that was humbling, you know. <laughs> and so I have a job now that is fun. I mean, how many of you get to be at an AA convention most weekends out of the year? And do you know why God made me this tall? I can reach across that table and, and give you big hugs right over my job. And so I just think to myself, oh, it was wonderful. So later on, I got to go back to work at a bank as a part-time employee so a girl could get her degree at a day, during the day. Um, so I went to work on time. I avoided conflict and gossip. I did my job to the best of my ability, greeted everyone with a smile, and I hung cloud pictures in my area. And they looked forward to the days that I came to work, and when I quit, they were disappointed. And I mean, that is a big change in what I used to be like and what happened and what I was like now. Um, what does my relationship with my, with my work look like today? I like who I am in the situation. I do my job happily. <clears throat> I am cooperative. Um, but we still don't always get along. Um, we must be aware that when we get hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, we're going to bicker. When I would call my, husband, my sponsor on Monday and he did this and he did that and he said this and he drove too fast and she says, Beverly, it's Monday. 
if you would just keep your mouth shut on Monday, everything would be okay on Tuesday. <laughs> and do you know what? When I learned how to keep my mouth shut, mind my own business, don't ask questions, don't defend myself and be kind and loving, I quit calling my sponsor on Monday with that same old thing. We hardly ever fight on a Monday anymore. I'll look at him and say, we're tired. You know, we're just tired today. Let's not do this. And um, so um, today I live by these five principles, which I just told you. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I told you about my relationship with my father. I got to tend to his needs until the day he died, and that was wonderful. It was um, an incredible opportunity, and as a result of that, my sister and my relationship grew, and that was not a good relationship, and it was all my fault. Um, I was just a mean sister. She came along when I was seven years old, and I just couldn't comprehend that. I had to share whatever um, was going on in that house with another human being, so I decided if I slapped her and pulled her hair from time to time, maybe she'd leave. Well, the fact is, at 20, I was the first one to leave. Um, so my relationship, um, my relationship with my sister is wonderful. She has five ch grandchildren. I have three, and from time to time, uh, we go to we go to the uh, uh, Cracker Barrel, and we have. We she says we were we were fussing one day, and I, she said to me, "You know what I think is wrong?" And I said, "What?" And she said, "I think we're both suffering from a pancake deficiency." So we went to the Cracker Barrel, and you know everything was better. And she takes care of my dog when I'm not around. Um, at every you know, and and I always I make her a picture card and. And um, she takes care of Logan, and I know she loves Logan as much as I do because I have a picture of Logan laying on her brand new sofa, and uh, <laughs> and they, you know, they treat her like if she was theirs, and and so I know my dog is safe and loved when she's over there, and um, so anyhow, my and the and my deal with George, I've talked to you a lot about that, but one of the main things when I was very new in the program and I got invited to do my very first chair, my very first meeting, I decided to do it on courtesy, but I didn't have a clue what that was all about, and so I thought, well, I'll look it up. And so in the dilemma of the alcoholic marriage, on page 36, there's a paragraph in there that's going to blow you away. It says, courtesy. Keeping in mind the word courtesy helped to remind me that my husband is other things besides a husband. He is a man, a person, and an individual. He is a man who does a job, earns a living. He is a helping hand to troubled people in AA. He is a person whose life experiences are totally different from mine. He is a mind. He is a soul. He is a set of emotions, unique in every way. He is a person to be respected to be considerate of, and to treat always with courtesy. And um, courtesy generates courtesy. Um, change takes time. Um, we have had to generate an environment where we treat each other with dignity. Um, we have to be, we were told that resentments were the number one killer of all relationships, and that's absolutely the truth. Um, sometimes we don't know what we're, relation, or what we're resentful at, and it comes out a little sideways, but eventually we figure out what it is you know, that we're upset with each other about. Um, the first time I was told to ask his forgiveness, I, I did it with an attitude, and I got sent back three times until I could finally do it the right <laughs> way. Um, it was very hard. It was humbling. It was humiliating to go to your spouse and say, will you please forgive me for my part in this argument? Um, and so um, today, now he doesn't, he doesn't always come and actually say the words, but he'll come to me and he'll say, will you give me a kiss? Which means, you know, he was sorry for being a jerk. And, you know, I might make him a fresh cup of coffee or um, make sure that um, something about our life is, is different, you know. And so you, as you live together, as long as we have, it takes on a different, but I know he says that he's sorry, and I know that I say, I'm, I'm, I forgive me for what, and we do these things, and we know that it's all, we never go to sleep on today's resentment. We absolutely always kiss goodnight, except for the past three weeks, he has had this terrible cold. He got a flu shot, and then got the flu, and um, so... Normally, though, we'd kiss goodnight, and no matter what the resentment is, no matter how much we have disagreed or not liked each other that day, we always kiss goodnight and say, I love you. 
no matter how bad I have been the day before, at 7 o'clock in the morning, I always get my coffee. And those are the ways that we say we love each other. You know, and it's not real dramatic, and it's not, you know, we're certainly not going to be written about by Mr. Phil or Dr. Phil or whoever he is. <laughs> but the fact is, is that we work the principles of recovery in our home and take the traditions into our home, and we try mostly to make sure that we work under tradition one, the greatest good for the greatest number. And, you know, and to always make sure that we're, we're in compliance to what the other person's needs are. And, um, you know, he likes to drive, I like to fly. Uh, so I get in the car with him and I drive. And sometimes he likes to listen to Rush Limbaugh, I like music. So sometimes we turn off Rush and we listen to music. He likes it bright, I like it dark. He likes it loud, I like it quiet. He, he's a morning person, I'm a night person. Um, he doesn't. He is quite comfortable in his old shoes and a and a real comfy pair of, of Dockers and a and a shirt with a pocket. And I like uh, uh, I like clothes, you know. And I like and I like to shop. He could care less about shopping. He likes hamburgers. I like salad. We are as different as night and day. He likes to read the newspaper. I like to read spiritual books. You know, everything about us is totally different. But on the other hand. We have a depth of intimacy that um, is about other things than sex. And we do have a lot of, we have um, emotional intimacy, intellectual intimacy, creative intimacy, recreational intimacy, work intimacy, crisis intimacy, conflict intimacy, spiritual intimacy, and communication intimacy in our own way, in our own way. Our way is probably not going to be your way. But we've worked out our own deal, and we're married 41 years. And you know, it's not—it's not all um, wonderful all the time. I have decent relationships with my children today. I stay out of their lives. I don't—I don't, I don't um, offer any opinions. I don't defend myself. Um, I try to resolve conflicts so that there's no residual resentment. Um, you know, all my daughter-in-laws and my son. You know, they're all children of alcoholic homes. And so, you know, we, I have to keep that in mind. My job is to be a kind and loving grandmother. That's all God wants. He doesn't want me to run their lives. So I keep my mouth shut, mind my own business, don't ask questions, be kind and loving, and don't defend myself. And so if I apply those principles to my life, my, um, my, my life works out really well. This here... It's my little bag of books, and it's in there. It's got my journal and my big book and some conference-approved and some not conference-approved literature, and I've got all my pens in here because I like colored pens and glue sticks and scissors, and I write with a fountain pen with purple ink. Now, if you're worried about where you can get that, there's a place called the Colorado Pen Company at the Galleria, and you can buy an exquisite fountain pen in any color ink in, in the rainbow, and I write in purple all the time. And... Um, I have a very limited number of um, little handout sheets there, and if anybody is interested in it, what I can tell you is, like if you're here in a little group, one person in a group, take one of the handouts and um, make copies for the other people in your group because I didn't, um, I didn't have very many. If you're going to keep a journal, what you have to remember, some people don't know how to start. First of all, get a book. <laughs> Go to Office Depot. They have wonderful, wonderful books. Uh, mine comes from Office Depot. It costs about $22. It's a whole page for every day. I like that. It's college ruled. I don't like to write you know, on non-ruled paper. Um, it's got shiny enough paper that the ink doesn't like form a blotter in it. So I know all those things about my paper and, the, and everything, and I like, I can usually fill that whole page up. I start out every day by saying, Dear God, good morning. Hi, it's me, Beverly. And then I go on to write about whatever, you know, my thoughts float like clouds through my head. Some are resentful, some are joyful, some are just content and peaceful, and I'll write all that stuff down. Sometimes I'll write a list. You know, today I would like to get the ironing done and get the wash done and do the bank deposit and you know, do this. Today I'm going to meet my friend for lunch. Today I'd like to go to a meeting. Tonight I'm chairing a meeting. God, will you help me with a topic? And I might just write all those things in there. At the top of the page, I say, Dear God, I am grateful for, and I write down some things that I'm grateful for. Sometimes I write down those miracles that I see. Sometimes I don't. But always at the top of the page is either a gratitude or a miracle. And I'm committed to that. There's very, I slide things in there. If I travel, I might put a postcard in there. If, if it's a child's birthday, I have their picture on that page. Um, if, um, 
if I pick up a flower from a place that I've gone, I might press the flower in there. But and I and I um, seldom take things out of the journal and take them into the next year. But I do have a little stack of things, including that Thomas Merton prayer and and uh, the just for today and um, and the acceptance for, out of the out of the big book. I have that in calligraphy. That was done by a friend of mine that died. And those are all in my current journal page, and I pass those on from year to year. There's a few things like that dollar bill in my pictures that I put in every year, but some other things that I collect I just leave in there. So actually it's kind of this this life journey. I was going to go over to Lake Louisville and drop my journals off into the water about two years ago, and a friend of mine who's a writer in in um, another state went, oh, Beverly, don't do that. Oh, my God, that would be a tragedy if you, if you threw those journals away. He said, somebody somewhere would maybe want them. He says, it's a whole, it's your whole life in recovery. It's, it's from the day you were born on, on February 9th of 1981 until today. It's the life of Beverly Burnett. And why do you want to throw that away? And I says, well, okay, then you can have them. So, you know, I, I, I've told a couple of people, my husband and my brother and my daughter-in-law, I says, if anything ever happens to me, this man gets my journals. And, you know, maybe someday I'll put them together and he'll write a story about somebody, about a woman in recovery who suffered a lot of grave things and still managed to be happy, joyous, and free at the end of them all. So get in the mood. Take the pressure off. Um, face your feelings. Keep your journal to yourself. I've sponsored a couple of gals whose journals were violated uh, by their spouses. So if you feel that it's threatening for you to write, if you want to write, I don't care if you write. I'm only telling you my experience. Um, if you feel like they're not safe, put them in the trunk of your car. I have a padlock, um, not to keep it away from my husband. I mean, he is more concerned about the privacy of my books than I am most of the time. But um, I leave them in hotel rooms, and so sometimes I padlock them depending on... I have a little lock, anyhow. Um, uh, put your words to work. Um, and some of the things that you can write about is to review your day, look at your motives, uh, harmful attitudes and, re and reactions, correct your mistakes, um, look at making amends, list the five things you are grateful for each day, note your improvements in your circumstances and your relationships, note a significant feeling every day, and at the top of these are a bunch of feelings in case, like me, you didn't know how you felt. Um, I start my page with dear God or whatever feels right to you. Um, ask for prayers for another person other than yourself and look for your obsessions and your patterns. And, um, you know, I don't know if I was able to leave you with anything um, that has been helpful, but what I do is, I mean, I just love to do this and, and I love to be able to share my recovery and most of all I want to thank you for being here, for giving me your love because it's your love in this room that generates my enthusiasm. It's been your love that has given me the tools that have created me into the woman that looked in the rearview mirror a couple of weeks ago and said, who is this? I have so much to be grateful for because without you, uh, I would be angry or perhaps have be sitting in an institution somewhere. And again, I want to close this by saying if you're, if you're new and if you're not sure this program is going to work for you, what I would like to invite you to believe is that this program has absolutely worked for me. And thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.